updates and highlights regarding a colloquium. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the colloquium committee. So the list is actually here. And also our sponsor, Utah and also Netizen Experience. Thank you for the sponsorship. That's why we are able to provide a cash prize for the most like them all. And also print uh, big banners and support others regarding the food and several other things. So thank you for the sponsorship from Utah and also Netizen Experience. Then a quick update regarding the postgraduate colloquium. This is the fifth LKC FAS postgraduate colloquium. Um, started in 2018. We stopped one year in 2022 due to COVID-19. And this year we received about 88 abstracts um, and we have more than 150 participants registered for the event. So um, a big thank you to all the students who signed up for this and submit your abstracts to make this event a success. Okay, last year um, our team was learn from the world top researchers. Then I invited top researchers from the US and some of the top 2% researchers from Utah. And then this year our team is actually what is next life after postgraduate study because many postgraduate students do not know what they can do. That's why I have invited a few speakers coming from the academics and also industry and also some of them actually from the US to tell you what is their life after their postgraduate study? So that's all for a quick update from me. Let me move on to the next session, which is the opening remark by our dean, Dr. Yabunchi. Let's welcome Dr. Yabunchi. see that uh, postgraduate program actually uh, we can see the improvement from time to time right from 2018 the first time we have the postgraduate colloquium I think we still remember is on the one of the first floor or the second floor and at that time we only have the maybe internal speaker and and in this uh, two and three year you can see that we can have the more uh, established researcher in order to give the the speech during the postgraduate colloquium, we have the external speaker and even the overseas speaker as well, right? And this year we can see that uh, we also uh, is a very interesting uh, team, right? What is what you can do after your postgraduate study, right? Because uh, most of us maybe do not know what should we do after the postgraduate study, and also uh, this postgraduate colloquium actually. Uh, give the opportunity and the platform to all of the postgraduate student in order to mingle around and know uh, your other friends uh, in this uh, research world and maybe can motivate you for the multidisciplinary uh, research after this, right? And today we have a very complex schedule and I hope you can try to uh, involve in the talk and then try to learn from the, our industry speaker, right? Uh, I think their wisdom maybe will help you for the, the rest of your life as well, right? So I think that's all and thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yap, uh, our dean, for the opening speech. Um, before I move to the first keynote speaker, I still can see that many students are coming in and some of you are still having a breakfast. If you have finished your breakfast, can you please move to the front? We are going to start our first keynote lecture um, as soon as possible. Okay, our first keynote speaker is uh, Associate Professor IRTS Dr. Yu Min Chen. So he's uh, 
he has a lot of experience not only in the industry and also as an academic so his profile is available in our program book let me quickly go through his profile with all of you so um, Dr. Yu worked in the building and oil and gas industry before joining LKC FES Utah as an associate professor so his title for the keynote lecture today is Advanced Fire Protection Materials for Stroke Extraction, Dark Work System and Electrical Cables. So without further delay, let us hear from Dr. Yu what is his life after his postgraduate study. Let's welcome Dr. Yu. FES uh, under the Department of Mechanical and Material Engineering. Okay, yeah. Welcome to this fifth uh, Legal Chair Faculty of Engineering and Science Postgraduate Colloquium 2023. So, first and foremost, I would like to express my gratitude to the University and Center for Sustainable Mobility Technologies for granting me this uh, opportunity to share my research experience with all of you regarding. Uh, this advanced fire protection material for smooth expression double system and electric curl cables. Okay, the images are uh, displayed on this slide. Uh, so the double system uh, protects us with this advanced fire uh, protection materials. And the next image saw the uh, fire radar box to protect this cable using the post up methods. And the next image saw the electric, electric curl cables protected with all these and one fire for the deep things. Okay, before uh, diving into this uh, topic, let me say uh, share a bit uh, about my research experience with all postgraduate students here. Okay. So as a postgraduate students, yeah, as postgraduate students, we should have this nature, this grow mindset first. Before you start your research, why? Because this growth mindset will enable us um, to continue growing and build our own path to achieve remarkable milestone in your life after your postgraduate studies. So you can see here, uh, I have the opportunity to work as a process engineer and project engineer before in oil and gas industry and in the field of building construction. So this experience. Is extremely uh, highly uh, beneficial to my career today. So of course, uh, after I yeah, may, may, maybe some student will ask, what is a research engineer? Yes, maybe my PhD uh, study is a bit different as compared to all of you here, because I was under a special grant. So I uh, put uh, I have performed this uh, title role as an uh, as a research engineer, here I have to design and develop all these uh, new technologies and products uh, to fulfill these uh, special grants. So most of my time I spend my research as seeding a skill as Saharan because we need to fulfill all the standard tests. That's why that time I spend most of my time as seeding. That's why I'm familiar with all the seedings or all the equipment there. So of course, after I completed my uh, PhD, and I joined this University of Utah until today. So of course, as an academician, we not only our role not only to to teach or supervise postgraduate students. Of course, we also have to perform our consultancy work. Yeah, as a scientist, of course, we need to uh, cut out with all these like observation. Then we conduct a series of tests to to assess all the observations and. All the outcome to publish all high impact journals. So of course, if you research bit to this group breaking inventions, then you can become an inventor by securing all these intellectual property rights. Then you have this opportunity to work with industry, or you can find all these investors to invest in invention. Then bring your research product into the market after this. 
So now let's start with this topic. Okay, what made a fire? Yeah, I think most of us here we know about this triangle fires. So these ingredients are needed to sustain the fires. We need the fuel, heat, and oxygen. Of course, the heat whether it can still generate or external. So how to eliminate these elements? Before the fire kills us, we have to know how to kill this fire, right? So you can see these triangles, heat, oxygen, and feel how we can store it. So first, cooling. So heat, here I use this term, uh, intermission form, insulate the substrate, absorbing heat endothermically, surface temperature drop below what is required for combustion. So next, oxygen. A non-combustible gas is generated to dilute the amount of oxygen in the air around the frame. So some materials, when you expose to heat, it will release all the non-combustible gas to stop the oxygen. So without oxygen, the materials it cannot be burned yeah, easily. So next, the fuel. An intermission form is produced to protect the surface of the coated substrate. That's why we need this intermission form to cover all the fuel. So to ensure this surface of this uh, materials won't continue burning. Yeah. So next, I divide this fire into five stages here. Yeah. So stage one, ignition. You can see it starts small. The ignition of small items only is <coughs> easily extinguished. Yeah. So no significant heat output here. So the key measurements, as a researcher or postgraduate student, yeah, we need to know all these key measurements to collect all the data analysis. Yeah. So you can see the key measurement here, ratio to fire. For stage one, in nitrobidecia, so we can refer to all these standard tests, uh, yeah, as syringe or other uh, like bomba. So PF476 or ISO 5657. Normally in university, we just use the Bunsen burner to test. You can see the small frame inductions and frame separate tests. Uh. So these are very simple and practical and widely used tests for in abilities and frame spread using a very realistic set of fire scenario here. So next, I move to step two, grow. So grow as more iron evolve here. Radiation from fire and pour smoke layer on ceilings. So significant temperature rise on the heat output. So this stage not easily extinguished. So the key measurement here, reaction to fire. So we can use all these standard VF476 passes, pass errands to identify all these heat release, fire propagation, friend spread, friend framing of uh, flow plus particles and the dynamic smoke production. Maybe for your information here, the cone kilometer here, according to this ASTM E, so uh, 1354, so ISO 560, we cannot find this equipment in Malaysia. Yeah. Because in Malaysia, we are, we are not advanced in this field. So I don't think, that's why even Smith also don't have this equipment because this cost a lot of money, a few millions. So I have the opportunity to conduct this test in Hong Kong that time. So this test is very, very useful to analyze all the data, especially all the fire behavior. Because one test, it can generate five data here using this cone kilometer. So I hope in Malaysia, in future, we will have this equipment so that we can conduct more research on this field. Yeah, then we can understand more about fire. So it used to mimic real world fire scenario in a bank steel setting by converting the oxygen uh, construction rate into this heat release rate. So next, well, this fast forward. So all items in rows involved here. All hot smoke radiation in ceiling in nice. The intense radiation from this fire from ceiling. So very rapid temperature rise in heat output here. It cannot be extinguished here. So no key measurement for this stage. So there's, there's no fast forward test, but phenomenon is observed in fire resistant finish and real fire test only. So next, step four, fully developed. So this fully developed fire is frames emanating from room. Focus now is on containing the fire. We have to focus on the compartmentation here. So the key measurement, we have to look at the fire resistance. Normally, in industry, this is the most important parameter we need to fulfill. So stability or load bearing capacity, integrity, and insulation according to all these pretty standards or Euro code. So last state five decay. So this can be longer states up because it's smoldering. It starts to run out of fuel and oxygen. Okay, next slide. Yeah, it is standard time temperature curve according to ISO 834 or ASTM E119. So maybe 
many, many, many uh, participants will ask, every time if you look at all these standard curves, you will see this curve only. This uh, white color is uh, this temperature curve. So actually, it is a grow just some state one until state five. So in order to pass the standard state, so the all the authority <coughs> come up with this uh, curve uh, to to fulfill the standard. So this you can see they actually imitate this curve from our real life fire case. Uh. So we just refer to this white color as a standard time temperature curve used in fire resistant testing only. So of course here we only pass ISO and ASTM. If you want to mention about hydrocarbon, that is a different scenario. Because a hydrocarbon is a bit more a pool of all like petroleum. So the heating rate here is higher than, than this white graph here. So of course in relation to fire, just like I already mentioned, in liability, flammability, friends spray, heat release, smoke, this under state one and two. Like. So state three is flux over. Normally, yeah, can risk up to 600 degrees Celsius. After that, fully developed here, you can see we have to consider all this stability, load bearing capacity of the steel structure or any uh, elements, then compartmentation here, integrity and insulation, and state five decay. So this graph shows us the overall about this from state one until state five. So next, what is, yeah, today I want to highlight on this uh, and one fire protection materials we call it Indonesian coating sun. So this one part of my uh, research area. And how does it work? So this coating will expose to heat, so it will start to expand. Yeah. But at ambient temperature, it looks like normal paint. Yeah, like all the paint here. Yeah, without exposing to any heat, it just looks like normal paint. When the temperature is at least 250 or 200, then it will start to expand. So it's often used as a passive fire protection system. Yeah. In commercial and industry buildings, as it can provide extra layers of protection against the spread of fire in protecting our life and asset. So even this building, you that building also have to apply this fire to the coatings. If you notice, you cut the car park or the staircase, uh, you can see all the dark, uh, they apply using this intermission coating. If not, all of us cannot enter to this building. So you can see, maybe I play these videos to work. Yeah. So the purpose of solving this not only so the intermission extend. So when we end the concrete, as you can see at the back, the concrete is exposed to heat. At the same time, this concrete later it will have this spalling of occur, meaning like explosive. You can see the concrete later it will at the behind it will explode. So of course the concrete itself also have to protect using this intermission coating. Yeah. So at the temperature of around 200 to 250 degrees Celsius. A complex chemical reaction for white light insulation from this in intense heat. So it undergoes rapid sublimation and extends several times. Of course, here normally if you refer to any description, it will mention 100 times to create a stable. You can see this actually spoiling just up the concrete. So no normally in industry, they design this coating, the expansion rate is about 20 to 40 times only. Why? Uh? If you say 100 times, actually it's not practical. When it comes to application, you know why? If we burn yeah, the substrate in this this one, of course it can adhere or stick on the substrate. Let's say now we apply on all the ceiling, all the duct, due to gravity effect. That's why they only design or formulate this from 20 to 40 times only. If more than that, when you burn, it will drop later. Once the charge drop, it cannot protect the substrate anymore. That's why it doesn't normally design 20 to 40 times if you refer to all the, all the companies that uh, are in this field. So next, so what are the benefits of using this fire, intubation fire protection coating here? So it provides a highly effective fire protection solution for the building. So versatility here, it can be used on a wide range of surfaces, uh, including steel, concrete, and wood. Of course, here I only mention water based. Of course, you, we also can formulate solvent based and deposit based. So, as that is, they are all architecture. They, their favorite is using this kind of intermission coating as compared to other type of fire protection materials uh, like cementitious. It look ugly. So, this one, yeah, is very nice if you apply on all the substrate. So, it's available in a variety of colors and finishes. Uh. So, cost effectiveness is the most important for companies uh, because they over. It's about dollar and cents, so time saving, space saving, and labor cost saving. 
So next maintenance, intubation coating is very low maintenance and does not require any special care or upkeep to maintain its effectiveness. So next, safe to use, water-based, low odors and asbestos-free. So because asbestos will cause lung cancer, so all these ingredients should avoid all these asbestos ingredients here. So next, fire-rated tower system. So the standard set by fire department uh, is intended to prescribe minimum requirements which are intended to restrict the spread of smoke uh, through dark system in building or into a building from outside. So you can see this figure, dark A, fire outside. We conduct this test, like fire burn from outside, also burn from inside. You can see dark B, fire inside. So permit the A dark system in building to be used for additional purpose of emergency smoke control. That's why our car bus, we apply all this. So ventilation duct system intended solely for the evacuation of smoke. These are intended to maintain their integrity and cross-sectional area within the fire compartment. So all they have to fulfill the requirements are set by uh, home bath. So therefore, due to fire safety reasons, most of the ducts are required to be fire resistant externally and internally. You can see this right side before and after. Before fire test, you can see all the ducts are coated with this one to make look nice. After Testing you can see all become char layer. But here we have to measure all the cross section area like, in order to fulfill the, the test. So let's start what system coated with this water based intubation coating. We need to consider three uh, parameters here stability, integrity, and insulation. You need to pass it three. So the ability of the duct and the support system to remain intact and fulfill their intended function for a specific period of time, normally two hours. Yeah. So the the ability of a duct to remain free from crack, hole, or opening outside the compartment in which the fire is present. Yeah, you need to ensure after testing there is no crack or hole. If not, all the smoke or will extract by the duct in, into our office room. So all this we have to ensure no crack and hole to maintain the integrity. So net insulation is the most difficult part to pass. Insulation. Why? The ability of the duct to remain is separate function without developing temperature on its external surface outside the compartment in which the fire is present with acid 140 degrees Celsius as an average above ambient or 180 degrees Celsius as a maximum above ambient at any one point. Because the fire test the maximum temperature is about 1001, 1002. So you need to maintain this temperature below 200 degrees Celsius. That's a very challenging. So smooth extract system must retain at least 75% of the cross-sectional area in accordance to this BF476 part 24. If you refer to Euro code, it's 90% different, more stringent. But in Malaysia so far, we just uh, follow this BF476 part 24. But the ceiling, they are really quite ready to conduct the Euro code. They are ready, but it depends on industry. So the design of fire resistant type of all type is described in all these BF5588, part 9 and BF999 in various sessions. So next, these all the standard specs are for this uh, intubation coating applied on this dark system. Dark system required coated with fire rated intubation coating. You can see all here, at least out nine, actually more than nine. Just we are list out all the main uh, system requirement here. As mentioned just now, fire rated dark works will be fire rated for two hours and still maintain stability, integrity, and insulation as per BF476 part 24. Some actually they once refer to Australia standard, yeah, they have to refer to AS1530.4. So restrictions of that due to buckling uh, after fire test will not cost up to the 5% or more of reduction in cross sectional that area. So next the duct works are combined to DW144 duct construction methods uh, like all the NAD. So next, the fire protective materials will be class 1, surface spray of frame and fire propagation, propagation as defined in BS476, part 6 and 7. Yeah, because that's how we refer to the uh, key measurement, right? The, the second stages, uh, yeah, you need to fulfill this one first. If you not under this class 1, means the material itself can burn easily, then yeah, we need to control from starting at first. So next, the fire protective coating shall be environmentally friendly, like certified and water-based. Uh. Why? We cannot use uh, solvent-based or epoxy based for our air conditioning duct system. Normally, this air uh, uh, they already installed in the building. So 
the applicator they only apply yeah, like two painting so make sure the paint have all this safe to apply if you use solvent base or epoxy base all this will cause lung cancer yeah so here they also need to certify so that's all necessary supports and other accessories such as sealants and gasket required for this completion of fire rated dark wall seal comprised with manufacturer test report so all installed dark wall seal will be certified by the manufacturer upon completion so fire rated dark wall seal follow the latest code of practice of fire resisting construction and approved by fire service department of Mumbai. fire protective coatings will not be acidic and not attract pet or rope or support the growth of mold so next the manufacturer will provide warranty for a period of years on the performance of the duct. Maybe some of you will ask how many warranty the manufacturer can provide for this type of intermission cutting. 10 years. Can last 10 years. But suggest to the time and condition, this type of cutting you cannot export to rain. For indoor only, then it can last 10 years. Uh, will you die here? How many already? 2015 until now, about 9 years. The cutting still there. Yeah. You can check the uh, car park already nine years. So the manufacturer they normally provide 10 years warranty. So next we talk about fire resistant cable according to the requirements for fire resistant characteristic here. So of course the fire resistant cable are categorized by the letter symbol here. So let's say you see CWZ here. So C means fulfill the requirement 950 degrees Celsius for three hours. W resistant to fire with water. Of course, all these tests, yeah, they will conduct the fire test at the same time they will spray all the water. Next, resistant to fire mechanical shock, then they will use the tool to knock all this cable to ensure it can maintain all the integrity, means no circuit, yeah. All this, yeah, measure all the current steel or, or function. So of course here, according to ceiling QS, uh, uh, QAS, and perhaps all this product certification license type test approval have to fulfill like IEC 60231. IEC stands for International uh, electrical or uh, uh, technical commissions on IEC have to follow this one. Even our Bomba also have to refer to this IEC 60331 or uh, 60332 uh, or BS6387. So, next, fire resistant cables are used very required by the local fire codes in the wiring of fire resistant safety circuits, public address, and emergency voice communication system in high risk building. So all these uh, occasions have to apply with this fire resistant cable control and instrumentation services in industrial, commercial and residential complex. So high temperature insulation condition. So next I would like to show this intermission fire protective coating for cable. You can see the number eight here. From number one to seven, we have audit conductor, fire barrier, insulation, wrapping, overall screen, inner sheet, audit but eight. Of course you can uh, provide this additional fire protective coating to protect this cable. So this is the cable coated with this fire protective coating. So the industry they also conduct this uh, test lab, just function burner test to observe this uh, uh, coating whether can expand, fulfill all this uh, char layer to better dense of uniform. So uh, after we burn, you can see they still can scrap the surface of the char layer inside. Still have this original intermission coating. So actually, all this can last very long, very long when exposed to fire. So they spread all this child layer, then they keep burning. They still can expand. Yeah. So maybe we move to the next slide. Yeah. I would like to take this opportunity to promote this event. Yeah. Physical events are one day workshop on standard test method for fire test of building, construction, and materials organized by IEN and MATD. Yeah, so this event, I think, maybe only once in two years. Yeah, for those who know, you want to know more about fire, test, and all the standard, then these two speakers are Mr. Hanafi and Ms. Sarifa. They have more than 15 years of experience in conducting all the standard tests at Sirin. Then they can share all this. So this program will start from 9 to 4 30. So all the, you can see the fire vision testing center and regulation, they will highlight on this. And delivering misconception fire resistant tests and their end use application. So, of course, you can see this. The special of this workshop, we will conduct this testing demonstration, real life test. The same stuff, they will choose one of the company or industry, their product, to test and let all the participants to see, to observe the real life test here. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's why not easy to organize this kind of workshop. Yeah, it needs to communicate with our industry. Yeah. So of course the reason fee here for students and girls are 450. Yeah. So with six PD points here. So if you want to know more that you can email the Miss Amira at im.org.my or contact the ceiling. C zero three seven nine six eight one zero 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 one or two. Yeah. So as we know, fire prevention, prevention is very important. Sir. Yeah. Bear in mind, it only takes one accident to start a fire. So don't let the fire ruin ruin our life and assets here. So everything fire safety. Stop fire before they start. Yeah. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Yu. We have time to take one question. I think um, we all know what Dr. Yu did after his postgraduate study, playing with fly games. <laughs> Any questions for Dr. Yu? Uh, maybe I have one. Uh, Any advice for the postgraduate students, uh, since uh, majority of them are postgraduate students? Any advice for them? Yeah. When I, uh uh, what as a postgraduate student, I have opportunity to conduct all the standard tests. We cannot be conducted in our university. So this is a very good opportunity. So that's why actually this is a very challenging and ambitious task as compared to, to other postgraduate students. But sometimes we you just think no pain, no gain. Yeah. When you learn a lot, then this one actually is a extremely uh beneficial to, to your future career. Because one, you understand all these standard tests. Even you can work in industry or you can work as an academician. Because if, let's say, all, most of my application, I will mention about fire standard tests. So it will be easy to get accepted when you mention about, we will conduct all the tests according to standard as compared to our less skilled test. Yeah, so that's the one thing. Yeah. So if you research my advice, if you can involve with standard tests, then that is the best for you. So after that, so you hope to just study, you can work as an attention or industry after this. You have to have advantage. Not all these students as that can be applied to industry after this. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Yu, for sharing his experience after his postgraduate study. Anyone interested in playing with fire, you can talk to Dr. Yu after this. Yeah, you're <laughs> Okay, uh, can I invite our dean, Dr. Yap, to present the token of appreciation for Dr. Yu? Participants here, if you have any questions for the next few speakers, we have two microphones uh, next to the chair here. You can actually walk to the microphone to ask questions. Thank you, Dr. Yu, for the very interesting sharing. So now we move on to our next invited speaker, Dr. Li Lek Chuan. So let me give a brief introduction about the keynote speaker. Um, he's online now, he's actually in the US, so we will do this via Microsoft Team. So, hi Lek Chuan, can you see us? So let me turn my screen. We are actually in a lecture hall with a lot of postgraduate students. Let me off my. Sorry. Sorry. They move. They move. They move. Hello. Okay. Sorry. Sorry for that. So we are actually in a multi-purpose hall with a lot of postgraduate students in the big hall now. So let me have a quick uh, introduction regarding Dr. Li Lekchuan's profile and then we will pass the stage to him. Okay, so Dr. Li Lekchuan is an Associate Professor and Associate Chair of Graduate Study in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at Michigan State University, MSU in the US. So he was a engineer before joining the MSU University as an associate professor. So, very welcome, Dr. Lee. May I know what is the time in the US now? 
Dr. D, can you hear us? Doctor? Doctor Lee, are you able to hear us? Okay, uh, never mind. Uh, let me just go on very quickly regarding his profile, then I'll pass the mic and everything to him. So his keynote lecture today is his journey from a mechanical engineer to a cardiovascular researcher in the US. So he has spent some time as a mechanical engineer after his postgraduate study and then he moved to the US to continue as an associate professor. So the first two speakers are actually in the academics, then after that we have other speakers from other industry. So without further delay and everything, uh, let me pass the stage to Dr. Lee. Dr. Lee? Electronics 
um, working as a quality engineer. So at the time, I was uh, working in the division where we were designing um, LCD television. So that was also a new thing at the time. Um, in the past, the television used to be a, a box. It's huge. But nowadays, um, you no longer see those television around. And um, a lot of those television are now flat screen. So that was um, kind of a new thing. But then I feel that life got a little bit mundane. So um, that's when I decided that I want to pursue a graduate studies. And doing that at the time will require some planning. So that's when I started to look for other opportunities and end up as a research officer in Data Storage Institute. And this institute is gone now, but ASTAR still remains. So I spent about two years there in ASTAR, and the research focus there was on hard disk drive. And again, if you look at it, this was hard disk drive in the past where we still have a spinning disk. And then at the time, my research there was mainly on the mechanics part of it. So what we are focusing on, on this reading up is to kind of um, look at how we can improve on the design of this reading up so that it has a high natural frequency so that we can get a faster read response. Um, and then it's also at that time I was preparing for graduate studies, uh, taking GRE and um, writing um, all the personal essays uh, in preparation because I was considering pursuing graduate studies uh, abroad. So I was fortunate enough to be accepted to do a PhD uh, in Berkeley, right? So I end up in uh, from Singapore to California, that's in the West Coast. And then my research in Berkeley was focusing on um, modeling grain boundary sliding in viscoelastic materials in polycrystalline solids actually. And the whole research topic is motivated by seismology um, because the information that we get from the model of grain boundary sliding can be used to infer um, seismic wave propagation. And if we are able to infer seismic wave propagation, we can use it to understand um, the materials in the deep layer of the heart. So that was um, kind of the research that I did when I was in Berkeley. Um, so it took about four years for me to finish my PhD. Um, but I would say uh, it's one of the best, best experience I have when I was there because I learned a lot of new things and um, actually um, I also took a lot of class. So typically um, the course curriculum there requires you to take um, at least 13 classes and a majority of those classes have to be outside of the department. So I took a bunch of uh, classes in the math department. And then after that, um, I stayed in the West Coast and just uh, crossed the bridge to San Francisco and did a postdoc stay at uh, University of California, San Francisco. So uh, it's kind of a campus in the city. So over there, what I was working on is largely computational modeling of the heart. So show here is basically an MRI of a heart that's beating and we use it to construct finite element models or computational models. Here you can see is the computational model of the biometrical. So I spent four years there. Um, so it's a big um, step jump or a steep learning curve um, coming from researching on traditional mechanical engineering topics to moving into life science. So I spent four years there, uh, largely to learn about cardiovascular physiology, cardiovascular mechanics. And then after that, uh, I took a faculty position in Michigan State University. So I moved from the West Coast to the East Coast. And then, which is where I am right now. So I spent Probably this will be my ninth year here in MSU. And my research continue on from what I did from my postdoc because I find that it's very interesting and it's highly interdisciplinary. So 
Uh, we have expanded a lot since uh, what I was doing from postdoc and we're focusing on cardiovascular multi-physics quality. So uh, that in a nutshell uh, is my journey so far. So um, research so far is great, exciting and fun, all right, which I'm going to talk about more later. But basically my focus of the research is um, on computational modeling and so computers form the central part of my research but then I get a chance also to work uh, together with um, for example clinicians, experimentalists and then we also do a lot of uh, fun stuff I would say experiments uh, using animal models we have pigs models as well as a rat model which I'm going to show you some example later and then we also work with um, the imaging specialists or clinicians or radiologists and we use a lot of uh, medical images to construct the uh, patient specific models so that's why we utilize uh, in collaboration with the clinicians we utilize a lot about uh, the various kind of uh, imaging modalities and uh, life in Michigan is also good except that it's cold all right it's can get really, really cold. So, but um, it has a very nice weather in the summer. And shown here, for example, is two pictures I took when I was uh, at a bridge. This is during fall, and you can see the, the kind of the leaf is changing color. And then here is basically uh, what's the same location, what happens during the winter where the river starts to freeze. So, um, that's basically my life so far. And now I'm going to switch a little bit to talk about uh, and grad studies and programs in the McEntee Engineering Department at MSU. And then following that, uh, I will talk about my, my research. So, um, I guess a lot of you here are already pursuing graduate so I shouldn't spend too much time convincing you uh, why you need to pursue a graduate degree. So I'm going to go relatively fast and on why one want to pursue a graduate degree. And the primary reason I think is that technology is moving at a very fast pace now, becoming interdisciplinary. But there's a need to catch up. And essentially, that's what I feel, uh, given the kind of research that I'm working on, that Research has become very interdisciplinary now. For example, I'm working together with uh, clinicians, I'm working with experimentalists, I'm working with data scientists, and I'm working with physiologists. So that field becomes very broad, so we need to have a way to, to catch up and pursuing a graduate degree uh, can help you to do that. But what I think is an important thing that I get out when I was doing my PhD is um, the training on how to learn to think and problem solve independent. So I think this is a kind of a soft skill that one can get out of a PhD. I think it's a very important one. And at least is at least is equally important as picking up the technical knowledge you get from the PhD. Because uh, you can apply this uh, kind of um, skills in, of problem solving to in any aspect of your life. And of course, um, the um, another reason why you want to pursue grad studies, well, you get a higher salary after you graduate, right? So you can see that if you are in the you are in the engineering, right? Comparing the starting salary to that of a bachelor um, is significantly higher. And there's more career option actually also because a lot of R&D R &D companies um, locally or abroad in the US are looking for PhD um, students or PhD um, of candidates who have a PhD, right? So um, introduction about MSU. So MSU, Michigan State University is the first land grant university and it has 17 degree funding colleges and engineering is one of them. So it's a very large university and large in terms of 
the number of people so the current enrol~ enrolment stand about fifty thousand students and then (um) large also in term of the the space (um) so the 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 entire space of the M_S_U is (uh) huge and in the college of engineering we have eight departments mechanical engineering being one of them but we also have other departments traditional departments like civil engineering chemical engineering electrical engineering and we also have (uh) newer kind of (uh) departments like biomedical engineering which is one of the newest one and also the computational mathematics science and engineering department and the enrolment for the engineering college is about six thousand undergrad and nine hundred graduates and in the mechanical engineering department we have about forty faculties about thousand and five undergraduates and close to two hundred graduate students so in the M_E department we offer two kind of (uh) we offer master of science and also we have offer P_H_D program which typically takes four to five years so we admit students to the P_H_D program (uh) with a bachelor or those students with a master degree and depending on what level they are admitted and then (uh) the number of course per credit is (uh) a little bit different but the key thing I want to point out is that students admitted to the P_H_D program in M_S_U in the departments are usually supported financially by a combination of teaching assistantship, research assistantship and, and fellowship. So I think that's something uh, kind of what is um, typically found also in a lot of uni- uni- universities in the US. So why pursue a grad degree in mechanical engineering at MSU? Uh, first is highly dis- interdisciplinary as I'm going to show you in some of the research I'm working on and also together with my colleagues. And then we also offer a wide range of advanced courses covering fundamentals and the latest technologies. And we do have a lot of uh, young faculties who are energetic and passionate about research. And as I mentioned, financial support uh, is available for most PhD students. In fact, it covers almost the entire duration of the, the PhD studies. And this includes um, travel fellowships, to attend conferences and there's excellent career prospects so our grads typically will secure jobs in the industry or academia some of those industry companies are uh, like for example Dow Chemical um, given that we are in Michigan so and close to a lot of automotive companies so a lot of our graduates end up securing jobs also in automotive companies and then um, some of them also when it goes to the academic. So this is an example of where our grad students end up, for example, uh, in Ford company, Toyota, uh, the school system, which is kind of the parent company for Abacus, if you are using Fine Island, or um, SolidWorks. So the research areas in the department can be broadly categorized into uh, these four areas, we have biomechanics and engineering, the solid mechanics, dynamic system and control, as well as the fluid thermal science and engineering. Right. But I would say the faculties belongs to uh, each of these um, areas are not necessarily just focusing their research in the particular area itself. They are also working uh, their research are also kind of interfaced with other research areas. So the funding that the department gets mainly come from NSF, which is the National Science Foundation, DOE Department of Energy, Energy and DOE's Department of Defense, NIH is the National Institute of Health, and then other also from industries like Ford Model. So research expenditure is close to seven million a year, and we do have a lot of interdisciplinary collaboration between MSU itself across different departments like electrical engineering, biomedical engineering, uh, pharmacological and toxicology department, and physiology. And we also have a lot of collaboration with uh, other universities as well as hospitals and leading companies like Ford Motor, um, Toyota, Chrysler, in in, in various industries. So in the biomechanics, uh, we have a number of faculties working to, in terms of uh, 
looking at um, different organs, right? At the heart, the arteries, the musculoskeletal systems, and also uh, the brain. And then we use um, combination modeling, experimental modeling, or um, in animal models to kind of understand the diseases associated with the different organs as well as um, the treatments. For example, uh, this is a left ventricular assist device. Uh, that's actually what uh, we are investigating. And then in the fluid thermal science, uh, which is actually one of the biggest um, group in the department, again, the kind of research that they are doing is very uh, wide, which ranges from separation and blood water processes to traditional fuel like internal combustion and turbo machinery. And um, they also are working on um, computational modeling as well as experimental modeling. So computational modeling basically is computation of fluid dynamics, um, turbulence modeling as well as experimental flow visualization techniques. Um, and application-wise, they are working in, for example, in microfluidics. And for dynamic system and controls, uh, the uh, um, we can basically split that uh, into dynamics as well as controls. And again, some of those uh, research areas, topics that they are looking into, for example, uh, they look at the dynamics of wind turbines, part of the clean energy uh, plus and then also on uh, autonomous vehicles, for example, here uh, is actually the, the research by Tsojini. What they are doing, researching, is creating an autonomous or robots to help with the picking of apples, especially during the fall season. And then also machine learning and controls, as well as some of the traditional fields like uh, engine controls, as well as the vehicle dynamics. And the last, um, research areas uh, is the solid mechanics design and manufacturing. So um, a huge part of the research is focusing on additive manufacturing as well as uh, uh, machining. And also we do have a number of faculties looking at soft materials. So those are soft materials, um, small devices as well as hydrogel. So um, how's life as a grad student in, in East Lansing? Well, um, busy, I would say, because the students, uh, besides working on research, they will be attending class and they also be teaching. So it's, to me, it's kind of a fruitful kind of experience. And there will be opportunities to extend, attend domestic and international conference. And MSU at East Lansing is basically a college town. So when we say about college town, it means that um, the town largely is populated by students during the semester, but then once the semester ends, especially in the summer, the town becomes a little bit more quiet. And that actually helps for myself because that's the best time to do research. Um, so it's about three and a half hour drive to Chicago, um, one hour drive to, to Detroit, and there are also Malaysian restaurants actually in Detroit. And MSU is big in terms of uh, football and basketball and this has four seasons, um, as can see. So, um, there's also a Malaysian student organization here. We have a small community of uh, Malaysian students here, and um, a, a lot of them are actually undergrads, uh, but we do have quite a number of graduate students, and actually two graduate students from Malaysia in, in the department. So, I think that's basically what I have talked about in terms of the grad programs in um, Michigan State University in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. So now I'm going to transit and talk a little bit about uh, the, my research. All right. So my research focuses uh, in general on computational biomechanics, right? but I focus largely on the heart itself. So I'm a mechanical engineer by training, as you can see. So uh, 
um, how do I visualize this complex system of um, arteries that and the heart that forms the cardiovascular system? So as an engineer, um, you tend to be very practical, right? So when I first think about this, I always relate that to kind of an engineering system that we are familiar with. So to me, the heart is nothing but a pump, right? And the arteries are nothing but just a series of pipes that are connected to the pumps. And what happens here is that the pumps are uh, going to drive the flow through the arteries. So essentially driving the flows through the pipes, right? And then, um, then the whole purpose here is to deliver nutrients, right? To, to the whole body. So that's how the me mechanical engineer sees the cardiovascular system, right? So in my lab, um, our mission is to advance and translate computing technologies to improve cardiovascular healthcare. And there's two aspects that we work on fundamental. What we do is to we develop computational models to understand the mechanisms of cardiovascular health in disease. So this is actually a complex problem. As I mentioned earlier, it gives, um, cuts into different research domains. For example, it has a solid mechanics component in the heart wall. We also have the fluid mechanics because we are dealing with blood. And then there's also electrophysiology um, because there's actually an electrical conduction system within the heart. And there's also peripheral kind of uh, domains that we make use to help us to develop better models, for example, statistics, medical images, and animal experiments, and also numerical simulations. And the other aspect uh, of my research is translational. So uh, what we do is we apply computational model to design and develop, as well as optimize cardiovascular treatments. But that's the goal. So, I'm just now going to um, briefly spend five minutes to give a whirlwind tour on cardiovascular physiology and mechanics. So the heart basically um, is a pump, all right? And how the pump operates can be categorized into um, four distinct phases. We have isolated filling where blood flows in from the atrium into the ventricles, all right? So we have these two upper chambers, which are atrium, and blood flows into the ventricles. And then following which the heart is going to contract, the valve is going to close. So this phase is called the isothermic contractions. And then as the pressure starts to rise, because the heart is contracting, the valve starts to open, and blood starts to flow up through the pulmonary artery from the right ventricles and to the aorta from the left hand close. And then the heart starts to relax and the valve starts to close. And because when the valve closes, there's no blood flow uh, between the chambers. So this is known as an isovolumic relaxation. And then uh, the cycle repeats itself. So if we were to plot the pressure and volume of the cavity, we get this is what we call the pressure volume loop. And an important index that the clinicians use to assess the function of the heart or the health of the heart is the ejection fraction is basically the ratio between the stroke volume, which is the amount of blood ejected out by the ventricle in each cardiac cycle, divided by the end diastolic volume, which is the volume, the cavity volume at which is the largest. So that's called the ejection fraction. So shown here is basically the MRI of, of a heart contracting. And what we see here is basically the left ventricle and the right ventricle. So over a typical human lifespan of say about 30, 80 over years, uh, the heart would have beat about 3 billion times. So to me, that's an amazing figure. So uh, what gives rise to the ability of the heart to, to contract? So if we take a closer look at the heart wall, uh, we can see that the heart wall can be categorized into three distinct layers, we have the epicardium, which is comprised of the elastic fibers and also the coronary blood vessels that supply the nutrients to the heart itself. And then we have the myocardium, which is actually the middle layer, which forms the bulk of the muscles of this heart wall, and it comprises of the muscle fibers and the collagen networks. And 
plus we have the endocardiac which is basically comprises of largely small muscle and one of the a unique feature about the muscle fiber is that they are oriented in a very curved structure as you can see here that is imaged using a technique called diffusion tensor magnetic resonance images that allows us to visualize how the muscle fibers are oriented in the heart wall and you can see that muscle fibers are oriented in, in a helical structure and that allows the heart to actually twist as it's contracting and this twisting is supposedly um, allows the blood to be more effectively come up to, to the systemic and to the pulmonary circulation next uh, we talk about coronary vasculature so the heart needs nutrients and that nutrients come from the coronary vessels all right and it comprises of the arteries the capillaries as well as the vein so showing here is actually uh, an experiment that we did so we take this is actually a red heart what we did is that we take a red heart out and then we perfuse that coronary vasculature with a radio black uh, materials it's called microfilm and then once we put it into the ct scanner we get a nice structure of the um, coronary arteries or coronary network in the heart wall and we can actually reconstruct the coronary tree so as you can see here the vessels are largely embedded in the heart wall so um, that's going to produce a strong interaction with the heart wall because you can imagine that when the heart muscles are contracting it's actually squeezing on those vessels and these arteries and capillaries and veins are responsible for the delivery of uh, oxygenated blood as well as also for the removal of waste from the heart tissue and the vessels can regulate itself so um, there's very strong cardiac coronary interactions which form the bulk of my research actually where for example when you exercise the myocardial work is going to increase and it's going to send a signal to the coronary vessels that's called a vasodilator signal and as a result the blood vessel is going to increase its lumen size and more blood is able to flow through the blood vessels and this helps to increase the contractility to meet the demand that the heart is required so it's a very kind of a close uh, you can view it like a control system which um, again based on effective as a mechanical engineering so showing is basically an experiment that we did this from a pig heart you can see that the heart is actually uh, beating in a pig right and then this is actually from uh, a red heart where we isolate that heart and then put it into a perfusion system this is called a Langendorf perfusion system um, so uh, this is uh, ex vivo experiments and this is uh, in vivo experiments that we do so a lot of things this arises because uh, the um, supply is unable to meet the demand so for example when uh, one of those mechanisms fail uh, for example the uh, vessel dilator signal is not able to um, reach the vessels the vessels will not be able to dilate so we're gonna not be able to meet the myocardial demand and as a result we can see that this is basically how it's gonna look like so this is the end of the experiments that we did the, the um, Red's heart actually is kind of struggling to, to be and that's also partly because we, we just kind of reduce the perfusion uh, to, to the blood to, to the heart itself so um, a focus of my research is to look at this interaction between uh, the heart muscles as well as to the coronary vessels so I'm going to spend some time to talk about uh, our effort in developing a computational model to optimize CRT, which is the cardiac resynchronization therapy, in response to ischemia, and how we incorporate perfusion into this model. So to give you a brief introduction, uh, what is cardiac resynchronization therapy? So um, as I mentioned earlier, the heart has its own conduction system. So when the heart starts to contract, it actually originated uh, with a signal from the sinoatrial nodes to the AV nodes and then through this fast Purkinje fiber system, which are fast conductor, conduction network and then uh, that allows the signal to propagate through the entire 
myocardium or the heart wall. So approximately one third of those uh, heart failure patients has the left branch spinal block. So left branch spinal block is actually so essential electrical dysfunction of the heart. So what happens is that uh, this the left branch of this fast conduction system is blocked. For example, uh, because of ischemia or because of uh, some other uh, disease. And as a result, the electrical signal is going to take a longer time to reach the left ventricle than it takes to reach the right ventricle. So what results is that it takes on average a longer time for this whole heart to be depolarized or to be activated and this result in the large theorized complex. And this can also lead to mechanical discipline, meaning to say that the left heart is not beating in synchronous with the right heart. So as a result, there's a lot of uh, mechanical inefficiency. And the cardiac resynchronization therapy can be used to treat this condition. But the problem is that 30% of patients don't respond to cardiac resynchronization therapy. So um, what we are trying to do here is to use a combination of combinational modeling, which you can see here. So the top panel here shows the activation pattern and the bottom panel here shows the um, contraction of the heart. So we're going to use the combination of modeling as well as experiments using big models, uh, which include measuring the mechanics as well as me measuring the electrical uh, signal in the heart to try to understand the treatment response mechanisms as well as to optimize the treatment response. So uh, one unique feature that has been ignored uh, in previous consideration of CRT is perfusion. And what we hypothesize is that perfusion is actually an important factor for treatment response. And actually there's a saying in the electrophysiology world that they need to be. So what we did is we include perfusion, basically the flow of the coronary blood into uh, our computation model. So you can see that this is the finite element model just of the left ventricles. But in it, we have coronary vessels that are invaded here. And then this coronary vessel is connected to the larger systemic circulation network. And this are uh, basically the kind of the three multi phoenix that we model electrophysiology, cardiac mechanics, and perfusion. And they are all coupled with one another. So, what we found is that without ischemia, um, the optimal pacing location. So when the clinician goes in and pace, they can decide on where they want to put the pace maker, the, the, the pacing lead. And what we found is that without ischemia, um, the optimal pacing site is associated with the shortest activation site. So um, that's typically will be pacing at the um, first location at which the activation occurs. But things change with ischemia, right? Largely because ischemia reduces the conduction velocity and also reduces the original contractility. As you can see here, so you can see that for ischemia, it takes a longer time for this heart to be fully activated compared to without ischemia. So what we found is that when the coronary flow in the ischemic region drops below 30%, that optimal pacing site if it's in the ischemic region, it's no longer the optimal pacing site. So, in fact, uh, what we found from the model is that the CRT response is determined by the pacing site as well as the degree of perfusion. So, down here, for example, we found that um, for two different kinds of animals, right, with same ischemia, the optimal pacing site actually differs. So what the implication here is that um, the um, optimal pacing sites for the cardiac resynchronization therapy depends on patients or from animals to animals. And which implies that um, one approach to optimize CRT could be done uh, in a patient specific way where we can use computational modeling and take into account patient geometry and also the level of perfusion to determine where the optimal pacing site is, uh, which should be leads to better outcome. So, as in the 
nutshell of what we are doing, but I like to briefly just go through some other projects that we are working on. For example, uh, what we are also working on is to, to look at uh, prior operation where um, here what we do is that um, the goal is to pump cryogen into a balloon to freeze the tissue and as a result of freezing of the tissue um, you want to um, stop the arrhythmia that's what is called the pulmonary vein isolation and then the other research that we are working on is to look at left ventricular assist device um, which is actually a pump that's connected to the heart the whole idea for this pump here is to help to support the failing heart in pumping blood to the circulation as well as also to unload the, the, the heart. So what we are trying to do is to apply the computational modeling framework that we developed to um, see how we can determine patients who after being implanted by this left heart left aggressive device um, may suffer from right heart failure. So one of the issue with this LVAT here is that uh, patients who have implanted with LVAT tends to also um, may have right heart failure, but it's not known why they will develop right heart failure. And then we also develop in models that similar to uh, biochemical bioenergetics, for example, we can uh, include the mitochondria, which is basically uh, the energy productions in the cells. And then we look at also um, coronary venous vertical fusion. So typically, I, I guess most of you would have known that if, say, there's an occlusion in the coronary artery, say, one can have a heart attack. So the whole idea then would be to go in and unblock that artery. But in certain cases, when the artery cannot be unblocked, one of the approach here, which is the retro venous vertical perfusion, is to go through the back door and supply blood through the veins to the ischemic region. So we are developing models to try to understand this treatment. Um, so I think with this, I would like to kind of uh, wrap things up, all right, um, and give some concluding remarks about the kind of research that we are working on. So combination medicine is advancing. Um, as you can see here, Upflow is basically purely a technology company that um, you provide a service to the um, hospital and they use combinational model to predict what they call a fractional flow reserve, uh, which is the measure of the severity of a stenosis uh, in the coronary artery. So this is a non-invasive way of assessing the what they call a fractional flow reserve. Uh, whereas the earlier approach requires an invasive approach. So um, now it's kind of um, used in a lot of hospital, and as you can see now it has a valuation actually close to $1 billion. And then um, machine learning and artificial intelligence is also helping to increase the rate of advancement in population of medicine. So it's becoming um, a kind of um, a very ubiquitous kind of um, techniques, right? And ultimately, uh, the goal of the precision medicine to improve healthcare, I think, is becoming closer to a uh, reality. All right, so I, I think I'm gonna stop here and just gonna acknowledge uh, my labs, my collaborators, as well as the funding sources. And uh, I don't know whether we will have time, but I'm happy to take any questions uh, that you may have. All right, thanks a lot. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, sorry for the technical glitches just now. Very interesting talk and research, at least to me. Any questions from the floor? Maybe I start with one first. I think uh, most of them are postgraduate students here. I think the most desired questions that they have is, you mentioned starting salary is higher in one of your slides. May I know how high it is? I think typically it lets me just go back to where that slides up. 
So I got that data from uh, a recent publication. Um, so you can see how much that salary is higher compared to. So there you are, right? So typically, at least seems to me that the starting salary for Venture is about 70k. Uh, I think this is based on US data. And then with PhD, it's well over um, 100k, so it's probably about 150k. In fact, um, most of my students who graduated work in the company and they are earning actually much more than I do. Okay, so you mean that academics are actually earning lower compared to working yes. in the industry? Okay. Yeah, depending on what phase you are, but let's say if you were to go to tech companies, for example, uh, I know for people who are in computer science, uh, they go to Google, Facebook, uh, their starting salary can be over 200k. Okay, uh, I have asked the questions that you want to ask the most. Any other questions for Dr. Lee? He's actually uh, in the US now, so I may know what is the time now, sorry. Now is um, 8.50, so we are 13 hours different. 13 hours different, so uh, yeah. <laughs> really appreciate so, your time at night and talk to our students. Any questions from the floor? Yeah, I think uh, probably yeah. uh, there's one, okay? Okay. Okay, um, hi Dr. Lee, thank you for the very inspiring talk. Um, I have a question uh, to you. From what you uh, explained just now, I can see that um, there's two important domain knowledge that we have to know in order to do whatever you are doing and in order to understand whatever you are, you are doing. Uh, the domain knowledge of the intensive uh, uh, medical knowledge of the en uh, human anatomy and physiology and also the domain knowledge of the engineering to do all the computational modeling. So which one is more important in order to start up or kick in kickstart an experiment that is similar to what you are doing now? Okay, so um, I think both are equally important. Uh, understanding the physiology as well as uh, having the engineering knowledge uh, the, the knowledge about numerical methods to do what we are doing. So I think both are, are equally important. And personally, what I feel is that uh, we are engineers. We have uh, the ability to think logically. So that put us at, at give us an edge in terms of um, picking out, say, another kind of uh, knowledge like. Here we have uh, cardiovascular physiology. So to me, that is easier to do so um, because all you need to do is just read, read up a lot, right, and then talk to more clinicians and uh, also um, to to physiologists. Whereas if you were to come from a non-engineering, uh, non-technical background, say for example. Uh, um, say a, a medical doctor, it will be very hard for them to, to pick up what we are learning uh, or what our knowledge is in terms of the, uh, the, the technical aspect of modeling. And also the same goes for physiology. So my colleagues are actually physiologists. Um, so they, they, they tend to be more difficult to pick up uh, the um, math intensive part in terms of the modeling. So, so, so in a nutshell, uh, both are equally important, but I think as engineer, we have an edge and we have the ability to, to pick up whatever we, we need to, to learn. Yeah, thank you Dr. Lee for the very interesting talk. Let's keep in touch because I find your research very interesting. Uh, my father had one of the heart issues or problems that you mentioned just now. And when I look at it, I find it very interesting. Let's keep in touch. Thanks a lot, Dr. Yeah. Lee. Thanks yeah, for your show. Yeah. Yeah. Alright. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Keep in touch. Yeah. Have a good night. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
Okay, um, we will move on to the next keynote lecture. This one is actually from Dr. De Kwan Tat. So he is actually coming from a different background. So he has a PhD, but he worked in industry. So his keynote lecture title is My Professional Journey as a Farming Equipment Engineer at John Deere. Uh, Dr. Tay will talk more about the company, just to let you know a little bit about his background. So he did his bachelor degree in mechanical engineering and then did a master degree in engineering mechanics. After that, he has a PhD in engineering mechanics, but he doesn't choose a career path like uh, the previous two speakers and some of our lecturers here, he actually decided to work in the industry. So John Deere is actually one of the largest farming equipment manufacturers in the world. So without further delay, let me welcome Dr. Tay. Dr. Tay, the stage is yours. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, introduction for uh, inviting me here to give a talk to the young postgraduate student, uh, engineering student here at Utah. So I hope my talk here will help you in your career planning in the future. So my, uh, the topic of my talk here is my professional journey as a farm equipment engineer at John Deere. So who is John Deere? So John Deere is a brand name for the products made by the company called the Deere & Company. So it is a multinational manufacturing company based in Moline, Illinois, USA. So this is a 186 years old company. It was founded by a blacksmith, just one person, blacksmith shop. So right now it has 82,000 plus employees worldwide. So like Dr. Dean mentioned earlier, John Deere is the largest, currently the largest agriculture equipment manufacturer in the world. So in the latest ranking of the global 500 by the Fortune magazine, we ranked 268. So for comparison, the only one corporation listed in the list in Malaysia is Pretonas, and Pretonas ranked 139. So this is for the comparison. So uh, John Deere is a well-known name in the United States. In Malaysia, I believe most of you may never heard of it. But we do have John Deere equipment here used in Malaysia. And this is one of the tractors I've seen in a, at a Petronas station. This is the Negri Samilan. Because in Negri Samilan, there are many Felda plantations. So they have used a John Deere equipment for their planting. So if you look at this model, on the left hand side, you see 50, 55. So that means this is a 50 horsepower tractor. So this is, for comparison, for the large tractor you see the farm, this is a small uh, tractor. And these are the large tractor used in the big farm. For this one, the typical horsepower is in the range of 500 to 600 horsepower. So it's 10 times more powerful than the one we seen uh, at the Pretona station. So what we do, what are these tractors used for? So you can see they are throwing some uh, equipment doing the field job. So this equipment, like the tillage equipment, this is for loosening the soil to prepare the soil for planting. So if you look at the operator, you can see on the left top corner, you can see the operator kind of facing the side of the vehicle. They are not looking forward. So all this equipment, they are all has a computerized control. It has the navigation or the satellite navigation. So once the operator set the boundary of the field, the machine will automatically run the field uh, by the guidance system. So the operator just need to monitor the machine operation and to see all the, plant, the plowing at the back is done properly. And then this is the tractor towing the seeding equipment. This is for planting the seed in the ground. So this one, you can see this equipment can plant 25 rows of crop at one, one pass. And this one, when you go to the end of the field, it will turn around and 
computer has a very precise uh, timing next to it. So it won't overlap or have a big gap in between. And this is another special uh, farming equipment called a sprayer. This is for spraying the fertilizer or the pesticide or herbicide. So this one, you can see the uh, special feature of this one, it has the body of the, the uh, equipment is high above the ground. So this one will be allow it to go over the crop which is grown taller. So the wheel, if you look at that, the diameter of the wheel or the height of it is about two meters. And then if you look at the lower left, uh, lower right side, you can see the sprayer. Right now, the new machine is a precision farming. So it has an optical sensor mounted on it. So it can detect what is the growing condition of the crop. Or whether it's when you're spraying the pesticide. So you look, detect whether there's a, a disease on the leaf and then you will spray it accordingly. So instead of just spraying all from along the way, you just spray it where it's needed. And you, you can see, I think you have heard of it. Now many of the farm is using the drone for spraying. So this is for another uh, application of the uh, farm equipment. So after the crop is grown, and for the time for harvesting, then we use the machine called combine. So why is the reason we name this thing called combine? It's a combination of something. Because in this machine, but if you think of it, during the harvesting time, there are three steps we do. The farmer is doing, one is to cut the crop, and then to separate the grain from the ears, and then to separate the debris from the grain. So this machine will do all this treating, all in one machine. So like next to the combine, there's a tractor towing the grain tank. So when the combine finishes separating the grain from the ears, you will then transport it onto the grain uh, tank and the machine will run it continuously without stopping so it doesn't have to go to the uh, unloading station to unload the grain so they will in greatly increase the uh, harvesting efficiency so these are the if you look at the combine the one in front is called a header so for different crops it use a different header in this heading it, Good, uh, is used for harvesting the rice, wheat, and soybeans. And this is the head, header for the corn harvesting. So this one is a different because for the grain, it cut and then move all those uh, things into the inside machine. But for the corn harvesting, the corn head will separate the corn ears, which you can see on the lower left corner. It will separate the Eels from the, uh, the stalk, and then the stalk will be cut by the header. It will shred it and cut into pieces. And then the, the ear will be go into the uh, separating mechanism inside the combine. So one of the problem the farming faced in the past before the mechanization is what the farmer do with the stalk. So usually they will burn it. So that create a lot of production. So for the big farming uh, country, one of the problems they are facing was the pollution in the past. But now, in the new me mechanical farming, all this stock will be shredded into pieces and then leave it to the ground. And that will provide the nutrition for the next crop to grow. And these are another special farming equipment, is the sugarcane harvester. And this is the cotton picker. So this cotton picker, if you look at the right hand side, that uh, round module, it will, once the cotton is picked, separated from the stock, it will be compact and roll it into a round module. And this round module is weighed about two and a half times. Excellent. So for comparison, a typical car weight is about one ton, uh, SUV about one and a half tons. So there is a very heavy uh, cotton uh, round margin. So in addition to the agricultural machinery equipment, John Deere also made the construction equipment and uh, forestry. 
equipment for the logging for timber logging. And besides the big equipment, you can also make a small household equipment for garden and lawn. So what makes the John Dan name so common in the UA is if they are not doing the farming, then usually people will buy the lawnmower to take care of their lawn. Yeah. And Americans are very really picky about their lawn. So they want to keep their lawn beautiful. And that is me back in 1998 when I was uh, working as a postdoc and later as a researcher at the Southern Illinois University. And the one I was sitting on is a lawn mower by John Deere. So that lawn mower, next to it, so that lawn mower was uh, doing the testing at our lab. So just like Utah, you have an uh, outside company setting up a lab on campus. So at that time, 20 some years ago, John Deere also has a lab. Southern Illinois University. So that was the, my first association with John Deere. So we did uh, research cooperation with John Deere and the campus. So that lawn mower was the first composite chassis. And my research background was in, the, uh, in my master work and PhD work was in the experimental work of the composite material. So that was very really, uh, related to what I have studied before. So if you look at that one circle, they call it dynamic signature of a concept vehicle. So that, at that time, Johnny was developing a process to uh, make the testing of the vehicle more efficient. So in addition to the testing of the vehicle, we also do on the right hand side, you see there's a from, uh, FEM model. So back in you know, 20 some years ago, FEA was not as popular as today. So today, if you do not FEA, you find the balance, tell people you are engineer. So at that time, it was a very advanced stage. So that was the first time I was transitioned, kind of picking up a new tool from an experimental uh, researcher to a computational, uh, to also involve in the computational uh, uh, study. So the dynamic signature of a concept vehicle is to expand on the concept vehicle under the spectrum of fatigue spectrum loading. So later, John Deere has a name called for it. It's called an ADV, accelerator design verification. So we look at this whole diagram. So in the past, the product development process looked like this. So the design engineer designed the product, and then you make a prototype, and then we put a total prototype into the field test. And once we pass the field test, it may go to the uh, many iterations. And once we pass the field test, then we put into the production. So the problem for this one is the field test. It will take a long time to do the field test. So for a product cycle, it may take several years, sometimes maybe five years, to get the product into the production. So the ADV, the purpose for that one is to shorten the field test time. So it's to do a, a field test instead of in the field, we'll do it in the lab. So we edit the, the non-damaging event from the field test and just do the, uh, run the damaging event in the lab. So a typical ADV test looks like this in this uh, video. So this is an ADB test of a combine. So what they do, or what we do is to reproduce the damaging event. The damaging event is to reproduce the response, the same response we measure in the field. So then we will run the test uh, up to the design line, and then to monitor the damage in the machine. So if you see the damage, then we have stop it, and then we design, and then build another prototype, and run the test again. So when uh, doing this uh, testing, when we collect the data from the field, we mount the swing gauges in some critical location in the frame, 
also the accelerometer and also the load cell in it. And then in the lab, we will use the same response. So there is a, a certain procedure here. The engineer will go to reproduce those events. So those uh, ADV procedure was implemented during the 2000, so around 2000 to 2010. And then at that time, when I joined the John Deere, I joined John Deere in 1999. So at that time, we were developing a new process called the duty cycle analysis. So what is the duty cycle analysis? So if you look at the, the second row, the ADV, when we run the ADV, we still need to make a prototype. And the prototype costs money, especially for the combine as big as that one. So the duty cycle analysis is to do the virtual ADV test in the computer. So without making the prototypes. So when we uh, successfully run the duty cycle analysis, and then we'll run the, make a prototype, and hopefully just do one ADB test, and one few test, and then we'll put it into the production. So in this process, we will save the money, and save the time. So we will greatly reduce the uh, design uh, cycle time to put the product into the market. So what is the, what we do in the duty cycle analysis? So we start with the CAT model, and then from the CAT model, we do two analysis. One is the multi-body dynamic analysis, using the load, external loading. So this one, we, there are many MBD uh, software out there, but at that time, we were using the atoms. And then on the, on the parallel, Path, we do an FBA model. And then from this uh, analysis, we combine the result and then run the duty cycle analysis. So at that time, and even now, we use the MR and encode design line software. So how we do it? So in the duty cycle cases, we run the, the several events. So those are the events determined by the design team. So those are the more like the damaging. When we say damaging, it's the fatigue damage in the structure, in the frame. So usually the cracking in the frame starts from the fatigue uh, damage or the fatigue crack initiation. So there is a process or procedure to use the strain life uh, history to do the uh, fatigue life calculation. So these are the, in the highlight in yellow are the six events. Uh, at that time, we were running a pilot project for that one. So each event is about 8,000, uh, 800 seconds, so it's about 13 minutes. So this is for the multi-body dynamics. So in this vehicle, uh, in, this is a lawn mover, so it's a small machine. That was the machine we used for this pilot project at that time. So the main uh, emphasis for this one is in the chassis or the frame of the structure. So they're uh, using the dynamic analysis, multi-body MBD, so the machine will run over a terrain. So those terrain was predetermined to generate uh, uh, damaging uh, event in the frame. So when, the, uh, so when you run the analysis, it will generate the input load at each wheels and the attaching, attaching point of the mower deck. The green color, you see that is a mowing mower deck or cutting the grass. And that mower deck is attached to the frame. So what we are looking for here is the forces and the moment at each attaching, uh, uh, attaching point. So if you look at the, on the, on the left hand side, you see the title FX. So that one is the, you know, I think it's in one of the wheel front, front right wheels. So we measure, uh, calculate the forces, uh, wheel XO force in the X, Y, Z direction, and also the moment in those three directions. So and then we generate 800 seconds of the load time history. 
So this is the FBA model. Because we are only interested in the frame, we don't care about the wheel and also the mower deck. And then we just need to have a proper uh, weight or mass on the structure. So we just use a, a block, square block to represent the seed, the material collecting system, just to uh, have a proper weight distribution in the model. So these are the FBA model, and these are the meshing of the FBA model. And then we run the FBA analysis using the inertial relief method. So if you think of it, when you know, I think most of you have know how to run the FBA. So you apply the boundary condition and then the load. But for this machine, because we are interested in the frame and the frame is moving, traveling on the terrain. So there is no fixed boundary condition. So we use a, there's a FBA in Hypercus. There's a method called the inertial relief method. So we use the mesh of the structure as the boundary condition. And we only apply the load at the loading point. So in this case, we have 10 external loading points, four at the wheels, and six at the mower deck attachment. So at each loading point, there's a six degree of freedom. So it's the translation, which represents the forces, and the rotation, which represents the moment at each uh, loading point. So in total, 10 loading location multiplied by 6, there's 60 loading condition. So we apply, if you look at the, uh, for each one, we apply the 10,000 Newton volt and 10,000 Newton millimeter moment. So we apply this loading one at a time. So we run 60 iteration or 60 runs of the FDA model to generate the strain tensor distribution of the frame for each load. So once we get the strength distribution in the frame, all we need is to scale it up with the time history we get from the MBD analysis. So we generate the strength time history in the frame for all these 60 load cases. And then we do the linear superposition to add all this up. 60 load cases and add it up to generate the combined strain time history of the frame. So we use the software, we call the input design line, so you just match the input load, time history with the uh, FEA result for each different 60 channel. And then at the end, you will calculate what is the fatigue life of each location. So there's, uh, if you look at the first run, run number one, so the goal for that one is for that machine to last 19.8 hours. So the design line will calculate how long will it last, whether it's fail or pass. So from there, we go back and we design the frame, improve the weak point, and run the iteration. So all this we run it without making a prototype. So once it satisfies the design condition, then we go ahead and make a prototype this is the basic idea of the design life cycle. So in, when doing the MBD, the MBD, the accuracy of the dynamic analysis depends on the tire property. So in order to get the proper tire property, oh, this one is for doing it. Okay, so instead of uh, running the MBD, we can also run the testing. So we just get a similar vehicle with a proper weight distribution and then measure the input load at each wheel using the wheel force transducer. So John Deere have designed and I also helped in uh, designing the wheel force transducer. You can buy the wheel force transducer from the market because in the automobile industry there are many available. But most are for the automobile wheel. So for John Deere we have a machine with a small wheel and then for the construction, all the sprayer, we have, we have seen you, they are two uh, meter high, so the transducer doesn't fit our machine, so we have to design our own wheel force transducer. And this is me running a field test for the gator, and you see the 
speak from the that each wheel is a wheel force transducer. And I run this one in one of the freezing cold winter time. So yeah, it was, I remember this one. I run this one the next day, I have to fly back to Malaysia. So I have to finish this test before my vacation. So in the vehicle, we have the wheel force transducer and the strain gauges in the mounted in the various location in the frame to measure the strain time response. And for the, like I mentioned just, just now, the accuracy of an MVD analysis depends on your tire model. So the MVD, the tire model is represented by the spring damper model. So in order to get an accurate result, you need to have the right stiffness and the damping property of the tire. So this is how we do the stiffness measurement on the right hand side. We do the vertical uh, stiffness of the tire, lateral stiffness. And then on the left hand side, we, we measure the damping of the tire. So if you look at the right hand side, the test plan is still small. Right? When we want to run the test for the big tire, like spare tire, there is not enough. And I have tried to get an outside lab to run the sprayer testing for us. And unfortunately, at that time, we couldn't find one. No lab is big enough to test a big tire. So what we're going to do? So, so, so the right hand one is the sprayer tire. So it's about two meters tall. So we cannot test the tire. Another way we can do it is to simulate the tire using the final heading uh, method. So my time is drying out, so I'm going to go quick. So we cut the tire, and then with the, the lower right hand side, you can see the distribution of the dynamic cord in the tire. So we get the uh, orientation, the angle of the cord, and also the diameter and the spacing of the cord. And then we put this into the FEM model. And then we run the FEM model to determine the uh, generate the tire property for MVD model. And also we can use this model for the transient FE analysis and for the tire soil interaction. So the duty cycle analysis, what we have I have shown earlier is the linear superposition method. This is for the linear cases. So they still have some limitation. So more ideal one is to use a transient FE. So you are accounted for the nonlinear effect. So these are the model we have run. They're using the Alpacus explicit to run the uh, transient analysis. So it includes the full FEA tire model and then the full FEA uh, frame model. And we also have an outside company, ESI, we also have a similar uh, program. So we run the comparison. So you can see on the lower right, Five. You see the runtime for one second of simulation. It will take about several days to run. It. So at that time, we were doing the technology development. It's not very really, uh, useful for real life application. And even today, with the limitation of the computer, even using the super power, a super computer at the national lab, at the Lawrence Union, we also have a cooperative project with them. Time will still take still take a long time to do the analysis. Okay, so this one I just show a simple example for the tire soil insulation because our model is one for the farm equipment, not like a car. The car mostly run on the flat surface, hardened surface. But for farm equipment, we run on the soft soil. So we want to see what is the how the interaction of the soil with the uh, tire with the soil. So we can see the style, the deformation of the soil and to measure the compactness to the of the soil. So with that, I think my time is up. So I'll stop uh, right here and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Tate, for the very interesting talk. Let's open to the floor for Q&A. We can take one to two questions. Any questions? From the floor, maybe I'll start with one first. Uh, why do you decide to go to industry after your PhD? Because uh, most of them are 
postgraduate students, I think they are probably lost. So hearing from you will be interesting. I think I'm not good at teaching. <laughs> you try once at the Southern Anna University, and then one time the dean of the college asked me to substitute for a teacher who was at that time has a summer uh, job at NASA. So he asked me to substitute for a teacher, and I didn't find it to be very <laughs> I'm not prepared for that, but I'm more interested to in doing the lab. Uh, lab. Okay, uh, that's a very interesting sharing. Please feel free to ask the speakers because uh, it's not easy to know what you can do after postgraduate study. That's why we invited people from different industries to share their experience. Uh, last call, any questions? Yeah. Uh, can you move to the front because we have two microphones in the front so that everybody can hear your questions. Thanks. If you need to turn it on first. There's a button on top, yeah. Press it, hold it for a while. Yep, I think it's should be. Hello, can you uh, share with us what is your observation to the development of the of the farming technology in Malaysia? Because recently we experienced the shortage of rice and then uh, due to the um, the restrictions of the imports of the rice from uh, India, right? And then also due to the Russia and Ukraine conflicts, then we also have some uh, short shortage of the crops and anything. So do you have any experience or any observation on this issue? Thank you. It's more like a political question. <laughs> 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 uh, maybe you can share with us from the researcher side uh, what can we do or what can we do any research on this? Thank you. Uh, well, it's still difficult for me to answer this question. <laughs> but I think because for the farming, it is a scale of uh, the, uh, the effect of scale. So for uh, in order to be self-sufficient or in, to improve the efficiency, you need to have a big farm that's in my opinion. But in Malaysia, that will not be possible, especially for the rice. But we, also, but we can do it in other fields like the uh, palm oil industry. And I noticed that in this area, there still is a labor intensive to harvest the, the, the palm. So there are not much machinery used in this field. So maybe for you, maybe a good uh, how we call the, uh, area to get into. The, uh, to design and develop a uh, uh, farming equipment for the uh, palm oil harvest. Okay. Thank you for the questions and thank you Dr. Tae for the very interesting talk. Uh, can I invite our deputy dean, Dr. Lee Kim Yee, to present a token of appreciation to the speaker, Dr. Tae? So 
you might think of uh, what will be your life after graduation. Have you think of this thing's question? Well, we are now pursuing your post graduates. Do you think of uh, whether you want to work for people or whether you want to turn some passions into business as an entrepreneur or not? Anyone have this kind of crazy dreams or not? If you have, you already did, huh? <laughs> If you have, then you are great to join these talks so I will share some of my personal experience. Might not be suitable for everyone, just my personal view, alright, solely personally. So probably it will help you in your future, so hopefully it will help to you choosing your right careers after your graduation. Alright? So these are the contents, basically just are questions, whether you should start your own business after your completions of your graduation. Elon Musk or anyone that's famous. Basically, they don't finish their graduates, they start their entrepreneurs. Uh, what challenges and opportunities you face as a new entrepreneur? Uh, how you leverage your academic skills and networks to grow your business? And what advice and tips you have for the postgraduate students who want to become entrepreneurs? And how you balance your work life balance as an entrepreneur? So, these are the five questions. I think most of you might be very interested to know more details about this. So what is options? I mean, after your graduation, uh, probably I listed six of it. So the first one, you can do a postdoc uh, at uh, other university, other than university, the so Of course, you can do the postdoc here also. Uh, or you can choose an option to find a job, just like Dr. Dave Woods uh, in John Deere's in the working industry. Or you can find jobs in academic field, like in Utah or working anywhere of uh, universities as a lecturer. Or find internships. Find a part time job you are passionate about or start your own business. So, we give a quick survey. Like anyone who do option number one here, all the postgraduate, just raise your hand. Just do a quick survey. Only a few. Three. Second. Second options. Okay. Uh, about 10 20%, which is good. I think industry need you. Uh, in this kind of areas. How about number three? Uh, university is a big problem. Nobody wants to be a lecturer now. <laughs> they will have a hard time to find a good lecturer in the future. <coughs> number four, find an internship working anywhere else in uh, vocations, holidays. Anything want to think of this? No? How about the number three? Only one. Two. Or behind them. Uh, last one, who want to start your own business? Anyone? Or at least you have two. Yeah, you're the right person to sit for this talk here. <laughs> Alright, so before you start your journey as a business, I think probably you have to go through some of my slides to get the ideas, what challenges you might face yeah, when you want to start your own business. So for me, I, I, I choose my options number two. I, I didn't really start with my academic job now right after my graduation. In fact, I was working in industry before I joined the University of Tunggula Tournament. So what I learned, uh, basically when you work in industry, there's a lot of things you can gain, especially a precious knowledge that uh, build up what I'm today. Right? Basically, that's the things I want to share. So the first thing is gaining experience or know-how and practice. So for my past experience, I was joining in these uh, Tanjong Holding Motors. Probably you don't know of this, right? You know what is a Tanjong Holding Motors? They are manufacturers of the Nissan car. They are one of the sole distributors uh, and also manufacturers for Nissan. And with these uh, Tanjongs, we have, uh, they have about more than 100 subsidiaries. It's basically quite a large group. Uh, I was one of the subsidiaries uh, working there as a research engineer, uh, Chasis. Something like uh, Dr. Day there, but basically what you're doing, I was doing there also. Alright, so it's quite a similar workflow. Uh, just to give background for you, uh, actually Nissan Motors have uh, three pillars. The biggest one is the Tanjong Motor Holdings, where basically dealing with all the Nissan's products, basically all their cars, all their trucks, etc. etc. There's another big pillar, which is uh, APM. Probably you heard of APM. Is uh, one of the largest Malaysia component suppliers. They supply more than 80-90% of the parts in your car seats, your suspension, your dampers, 
your aircon systems, about 80 to 90 percent is coming from this group, APM. And the last group is uh, Warisan, they have a non automobile business. Basically, is you will be surprised something like Sin Shadows, something like Mayflowers, travel agents, is also under their groups, and also women's lingeries brands. Also, they have a manufacturing house of it. So, they are basically quite a large group of it uh, in these areas. So, I was luckily I will work in one of the subsidiaries, which is kind of like their Dato Toys companies, very interesting things. In our companies, we have more than 50% of uh, my GMs are all Japanese, Taiwanese. And also one of the directors is from US. So basically, they have an initial plan is to build their own car. I mean, the Dato have their dreams. Rather than uh, always work for Nissan to build Nissan car, they want to have their own brands. Right? So basically, it's something like, uh, if you know of uh, Taiwan Yulong Jituan, they are also one of the Nissan manufacturers, but at the end, uh, they bought over the chassis design from Nissan and they turned to become their car. Their car logo is something L. I don't know whether you, you rarely see in Malaysia, but it's, it's overseas. So, so happened because of their, uh, the, the Dato's have a relationship in the Taiwanese side. So, they know what they're doing. So, they try to plan this kind of business. So because of this natural uh, business, I have the opportunity to uh, engage in various fields. So because my superiors is uh, in uh, bricks experts, working 30 years, 40 years plus in the Mitsubishi Fuso. And uh, the other GM's colleagues are specialized in transmissions, uh, specialized in testings, specialized in crash testings, so there are a lot of uh, various uh, superiors, they are expertise in different fields and they pay quite a number of uh, their salary. I mean every year, a few million of salary just for them, so that's our many expenses for the companies. So because of this nature, I, I learned a lot from them. Basically, I know how to uh, <coughs> culture of Japanese, how they run their business or how they run their daily operations very systematically. I would say it's super in terms of their documentations, how they run their meeting minutes, how they are supervising the coordinates, uh, right? And also, more of a culture different between Japanese and Malaysia. <coughs> they always keep on their times. Their, their meetings conduct very efficiently. So all these things are something you could not get in the university because of the nature of the university is to educate, educate uh, knowledge. This kind of uh, management skill, I would say, management skill or engineering skill set uh, that builds along with this kind of uh, nature is very precious. Just I met one of the engineers who specialize on the gear design. So you can pinpoint the failure modes huh, without really detailed analysis and just ask the engineers to go and run material composition. You just look at the composition, oh, this element too much. Uh, you need to get material, this one looks small. It's the kind of knowledge level, you know. So it's like very experienced that we can uh, glad to learn from them. So all these things is a precious knowledge you can get when you work outside. So it's not about uh, daily routines, what documentation works you, you learn. But actually you can observe how a company operates. That's very important because you want to start your business, right? And a day you need to manage your employees. You need to how to make a business plan. Uh, because my colleague is on the business development unit. So on and off, they also need to do market studies to see what are the car models we need to bring into Malaysia to sell. Right? So all these works, natures, I, I get a lot of exposure and learn from them. Right? That's how it's precious we work outside. Establishing networking, uh, yeah, your colleague is all your networking basically. So now I have a uh, networking of worldwide, right? From now they are back to Japan, so they are back to Taiwan and some of it in Shanghai is still holding a big position in some big firms. And even one of my uh, directors is went back to Lucid Air. You know, you heard of Lucid Air, right? Yeah, he's one of the engineers the department's head on running the crash testing. So familiar, we start with corporate operations because 
as I say, you need to learn how to manage those yes, things. Uh, you can't really get much from textbooks. It's, it, it's suited for different major or cult, I would say cultures. Uh, because in Malaysian culture, in Japanese cultures, or in anywhere else, uh, you, you need to balance a dedicated set of management systems. Might not be suitable you directly adopt certain culture from Japanese or US. So you have a culture shock over here. Because in my past, it's funny because I have a, sorry, I have a US director back from US, and I have a group of uh, Japanese colleagues. They always fight each other because Japanese and US, because of the last time World War II crisis. Uh, they have this, because they are, they are very kind of uh, elders, uh, Japanese, very classic people. It's like at their age of 60, 70. So they always fight because of the different cultures. So you, usually our US director is very flexible, but Japanese is very rigid. They, they cannot be flexible. They, they cannot tolerate that kind of flexibility. That's very interesting thing. Understand the market's supplies and demand, right? Uh, these are very important because you want to run business, you need to know where is the supply demand issue. You need to establish your production line. You need to know where to find the raw material sources cheaply or economically. <coughs> and then where is the market, how you position your products. So all these things I learned when I was there because my colleagues doing all this business development. They do a lot of uh, detailed statistics analysis on the car model segments in the Malaysia. Then they see, oh, there is a gap to post. This kind of point range, this kind of car size is not available in Malaysia, but it's part of the products from Nissan. So not all the products of the Nissan car you see in the world is available in Malaysia. Because some of the product, the pricing range and the types are not suitable to nature here. So they have an option to pick which are the models they want to bring in. So this kind of uh, how you positioning your strategy markets, where is your audience, uh, how you put on the sales, and once you bring in the model, what is the consideration, how you set up your production flow, how you can quickly convert your existing production lines to suit for these kind of models, how many variants you need to mix. So a lot of these things have involved a lot of uh, financial considerations calculations, running the mathematic models to calculate how much investment you need to put on. So all these things are very important where rarely you have it in research world or academic line, you expose this kind of uh, book knowledge, right? So that's where I'm lucky enough where, when I work, I have this kind of opportunity to, to learn all these things. So basically all this will help you to build out your competencies where opportunities come, you can grab well prepare yourself to venture into something new. So if you're not well prepared for all these things, directly venture into the business is kind of very risk steps, I would say. Because there's a lot of uh, this kind of knowledge, you might need to have a steep learning curve during you kick off your business. So are you ready for new business or not? So if you have something in mind, uh, there's some things I can advise. So first is whether you find an opportunity of getting out of business or not. Do you find something you want to sell? What kind of product do you want to sell? Whether it's a service or it's a product, do you solve problems or not? Most of the problems we have today is solving people problems, just like John did, right? Solving farming problems. Where they can utilize their automated systems to weave a minimum labor courses in deals to have the biggest harvesting you that you can obtain. That's why people will buy their products. Very reliability, very reliable. So when you want to start a business uh, for here, uh, basically I will foresee you most likely end up to be a tech startup you know, because you are in the research line. Uh, probably you will want to turn your research output into some things you can make money. I think this is normal, right? A lot of people will think of this future. You're solving some problem. So you think of your products will be uh, sellable to all the people. But the thing is, have you think of who we're going to buy your products now? and how much you're going to sell these products? How much of profit do you plan to make? So this, all these things actually it tunes or it directs your research directions because initially if you don't think of this before you kick off any research, by end of the day you have a research output might not be something suitable for productions or commercialization. Because uh, 
in business world, I think cost is still the main factor driven for most of the profits. So how you mix your... Doesn't mean that you always have to go for a cheap option, but we want something reliable at the same time affordable for most of the users can pay for it. They're willing to pay hundreds, two hundred, one thousand, hundred thousand to buy your product. So what quality you can promise to your clients with the kind of product which you want. So that will determine what kind of research methodology you want to adopt to reduce your research development cycles, materials, all right? You can have uh, exotic materials have an uh, extreme performance, but at that kind of extreme prices, who willing to pay for it? So actually this minds, uh, if you want to keep on with this kind of ventures, you might need to consider this before you keep off any research. It's very important. Because by the time you get your result and you want to switch it to different materials, it's too late. You have to restart the whole process again. All right, so characteristics you are required and also funding. Uh, funding, I will come back later on in the next slide. So what are the characteristics we required? So I listed <coughs> some things I think is very important. First is uh, self discipline You cannot say today I work, tomorrow I don't work, and I dream to become a big boss like Elon Musk. It never happens. It will never happen this way. No free lunch in this world. Whatever you want, you need to earn for the hard works you pay for. Uh, curiosity, eager to learn more, explore more, because there's still a lot of uh, knowledge domain that you need to learn other than what you have accumulated in your research world. Willing to experiment those, uh, not afraid of trying new things, a risk taker, something you must have, I would say, because the last, the double adaptability, right? flexible, resilient to face uncertainty and changes, because we face these challenges in the past two years MCO. A lot of business cannot turn over, they shut down because of the MCO period. So you must have uh, this kind of preparation for resilience and adaptability to this kind of uh, situation might happen. Nobody would think of MC what happened, right? So it strikes suddenly and a lot of business cannot turn over because of cash flow, because of getting a new business. Then end up a lot of business are uh, closing down. And it, it transformed the whole landscape of Malaysia from a very traditional trading to e-commerce trading. It, it actually is spin up the touch and go e-wallet payment by almost five to ten years times. Never nobody will never thought of the e-payment to be so fast and popular when they start launching. Because of this event it came very, very fast. So whether you are fast enough to adapt this kind of uh, boats you now if you ride on this wave, there's probably your millionaire by now. Right? There's a lot of business closing down but also there's a lot of business is booming make a lot of fortunes out of it. Uh, be patient and vision. So, of course, patient is something you cannot uh, avoid. Because if you don't like something, it's very hard for you to day in, day out, work 24 hours, 7 days a week for some things you want to go. So if you don't like it, I think it's unlikely you, you can strive to go easily. So you must be have a very passion of what you're doing. And also, have a clear vision. It's very important, just like what is your goal in the next one month, two months, six months, one year, two year, three years. You have a short term goal, long term goal, intermediate goal to drive your strategies, planning. So these are very, very important characteristics. I think is uh, important. So now you see on the left, uh, basically it's quite similar to the Dr. Deja sound. It's also the Adams. But it's slightly different is uh, in my past PhD, I was doing on the automotive uh, optimization design for protons. So I had the chance to work with uh, protons engineers. In the old days, something very funny happened. You know protons bought over Lotus, right? Everyone know. But actually, the Lotus technology is not transfer 100% to protons. And the protons engineer would not know what Lotus is doing. So they have a new model's car launching that will advise Lotus to do the consolidations. So Lotus will give them the set of data. You just do like this, like this, like this. And at the end, yeah, you get a very nice drivable car. But the engineer in the products don't know what's happening. They just execute based on what the advice is given. Uh, because, I uh, cannot blame them, because when they brought over, there is also agreements. Lotus have a lot of clients <coughs> other than protons. Have the Lamborghinis, uh, Ferrari, it's also their clients. They cannot own the data, and they cannot access those data. So we have this 
uh, Tech Law Funds to fund one of my PhD titles where I work a lot on vehicle dynamics. So I, I, I do a lot of uh, tunings on the vehicle suspension, springs, temples, geometry <coughs> to get a nice handling vehicles but also not sacrifice too much on the right handling. So we put on the algorithm, stochastic algorithm, run on the HPC uh, 3 to 4 work session. It, it took me about one to two weeks time just to get one uh, optimized result, which is about the whole vehicle's design. I'll be talking about more than 200 design parameters obtained at once. So those are in the past that I did, uh, but at the end of the day, I, I don't really do that. What I do is uh, on the effective manufacturing, because my passions during my graduation like for cities business, this industry is very limited because in Malaysia, majority is only protons. I would say. Of course, you have a Prud work. Prud also have a research house. Uh, Proton is the biggest research house. Those uh, you see in the video just on the four rig tested poster, right? Uh, in Proton's habit. So not only in the video you see just now in the jump deal, you have a chance to go to Proton Shalons visit. You can have a chance to see those four posters. They, they did it in the labs to evaluate their cars and the competitors' car. So those are my, my past, but now what I'm doing here is uh, basically I, I'm doing a lot of uh, 3D printing uh, Because my patient, the top left corner that is my first prototype that I built back in 2014, about 10 years, 12 years back Where I just hobby, as a hobby Because I like design things, but I find that outsourcing the parts to Malaysia workshop is just too expensive I cannot understand why a simple part I cannot accept this kind of pricing. So I, at the time, because of uh, prototyping patents, is already uh, finished after 30 years. Then, then there's an open community. They start to give it open source. That's where the booming of uh, 3D printing uh, started to be, become popular at times. So I was looking at those uh, Googles. I see, oh, quite interesting. So why not? I, I big one. I can afford simple one. So, because I can mechanical design, I can do all this motion design myself. I can just build one myself. So from there, when I, I joined Utah at times, I was thinking like, hmm, should I turn my patience or hobbies into something research like I want to do? So I took these options, and uh, throughout the four or five years, I built uh, various types of the uh, printers. Yeah, from a simple design until I getting the Utah seed grants to build a much more bigger and then later on, uh, it, it proceeds to a much more advanced systems. So this has not been achievable in one day, it's about four or five years times. It took me four or five years time to just build the platforms, right? Hi. So, what I see the problems in the markets and what is uh, our proposed solution is we see in Malaysia, uh, workshop especially, uh, those machining workshops, they are lacking of uh, human uh, external for foreigners because all the workshops are running 90% or 80% of it is, is from the foreigners to run the CNC, run the big machines, milling machines. There's nobody in the Asian country like you would like to work in the workshop, right? We can consider those kind of like 3D jobs, nobody even works. So a lot of uh, workshops uh, owners, some of my friends also, last time I met, they, they plan to shut down business because they, they can't get the land, manpower to operate all this business. And Malaysia actually, we are quite heavily relies on manufacturing. And a lot of the parts required to be fabricated. And at that time, 3D metal printing is kind of very expensive. Even today, it's, give you an idea, if it's a laser powder bed fusion, it costs about 1 million USD. We haven't considered the cost of bringing in import duty tax, etc., etc., training, facilities, all those PPE ventilations uh, to sell the production lines, right? So those causing a lot of fortunes. None of the Southeast Asian countries have a lot of uh, opportunity of willing to invest in some uh, products. 
So what we did here is uh, we, we came up with something different. Can you move to the next slide? Oh, never mind, I just called. So what, what we plan to do is we look at the mental printing system, why it's so expensive. Because mainly it's, uh, they're running on laser, right? Their powder use is different grades, very expensive. It costs more than two times compared to the MIM uh, metal powders. So at the same time also I have uh, colleagues working on uh, binder systems that she was uh, trying to explore based on the gender. So later on she's lost her interest. So I, I say, why, why not we, we do something differently? We have the powder system or binder systems right there. And what I do is just try and make some powders, metal powder inside and try to fuse. And it turned out to be a positive. I said, wait, that's something I can do. So the discovery of this research is not planned, but it's out of accident. Out of accident such that we have a curiosity, try out something different. Which end up today, we have a surgery based uh, 3D printing system that don't really keep requires uh, laser. We can do it in room temperatures. So we carry the most expensive part of the equipment, <coughs> power source, which is a laser. That brings us significantly cost saving in terms of machinery investment. So what we do now is basically, as you see in the videos, how we can do the metal printing. So this is the metal printing solutions. They will dry naturally in room temperatures. No heat required, that's ambient air will do. That's how beauty it is. But to get to this stage, actually it took us more than three to four years time of research with my PhD students uh, day in, day out, try different things. Uh, not easy to achieve this. So because we, we do two things at once, I, I build the printers, I build the system, I build the delivery systems. Because the delivery system in the market is all filaments, it's all plastics, it's all solid dry. What we're doing here is all liquid dry. All is in liquids, ink. So it works differently, it behaves differently. But this doesn't really stop us because we are mechanical engineering, so we can do all sorts of fantastic jobs. Right? Automobiles working also not an issue. How about this liquid delivery system? Easy job. So I take on this challenge. <laughs> I did it. And then the next part is we had to formulate the materials, how to find uh, alternative materials. So at the end of the day, uh, we are about to launch these products. We have uh, products where we can do room temperature printing with uh, standard steel powders, carbon steel, copper, ceramics. You need it, most of it we can do it. Even silicones, we did it. And what we do here is after we do a room temperature printing, we will put into the furnace, that's the end of the day. <coughs> Fantastic, right? You only have one engineer, you scale out five printers, ten printers, one furnace, you do it in batch. One engineer you need it. And then the remaining is all machine did the work for you. So that's what our solutions we're going to sell to the market at the affordable pricing. We're talking about the cheapest nowadays we benchmark with like metal desktops or even Mark Forge. The selling price to Malaysia is about one million. Ringgit simulations, so we are talking about about 50% of their pricing. So we say that we have a strong cases and also we foresee we will a lot of industry interested to adopt this kind of technologies. So what we are doing here is uh, we, we save we save a lot of causes. These are the conventional the conventional here is referred to metal additive printing of the laser based systems. They usually the front part is still remain the same, we don't, we don't change anything. But the build part is different because they require laser. Right? Laser is something very expensive. And because of their powders, laser center directly, they have to be achieving a very extremely low oxygen content. So to produce those powders are very, very expensive. So what we have here is we're using much more established powder. Basically, it's those uh, metal injection molding used. The pricing is about 50% off for 3D printed grids. And we already cut out the laser. And the beautiful part is we simplify all the post processing. Because we don't deal with loose powder, <coughs> room temperatures, whatever left over there is a solid metal scraps, it's safe. So you no need PPE, 
You don't need ventilation. You don't need uh, those powdering stations, sieving stations, washing stations, etc., etc. Those are the costs that's not given in your advertisements. They only show you fantastic laser skill. The fine coming up. But they don't know how much cost you need to invest other than their machines, one million. Right? So these are the things we, we try to achieve to simplify and we can achieve zero wastage. Even our scrap parts fail, don't worry. You give it to us, we can remelt and reuse again. Totally zero wastage we try to achieve. And at affordable pricing and very green solutions to the industry. So what challenge and opportunity you face as a new entrepreneur? Of course, if it's a startup, a tech startup, you have a lot of challenges. Not only technically challenge, but also funding challenge. Because dealing with tax, you need a lot of money, right? All this powder, even though we say 50% out from the powder grid, but it's also very expensive. And you need a lot of it. So you need to develop a strategy, how to build out your business model. These are very important. That's why you can get your funding. Because without a good business model, how are you going to pursue your business partners to invest on you? Even though you have a product, but you don't know how to kick off the sales, where is your audience, how much generate revenue you were expected to have, how they were willing to pay off a few millions to you to just start up a company. So these are important things. And after you get the funding, so you know how to manage your budget, cash flow, sustain the revenue is very important step after you have it. But usually company is very hard to survive after three years. Because first year funding, probably you can get loans or you sell money, you do something. To sustain, you need revenue. Those are the difficult parts. So the challenges I face here, basically you can look at here, it's a, it's a steep learning curve. Because we are coming from engineering backgrounds, so we have to run a business. So we have to know a lot of the legals, things you can do, you can't do, which is not violating the Malaysian laws, all right, ethically. And also running your HR, because my myself is not a director. I had to be the manager, I had to be the HR manager, <laughs> I have to be the R&D manager. <laughs> everything, I say everything I have to do myself. Me and my partners, luckily I have my partner who is uh, experienced uh, businessman is running the big firms. So he had all this established, so it's much more easy for me to go through. And um, writing business proposal, pushing our technologies from uh, PIL 2 3 or technology readiness. This one, NASA, I think they can explain. This is coming from them. Yeah, NASA skill, technology readiness. We use this to do the evaluation for our uh, grants also. So we have to write the proposal to get the government funding to help us to it to the commercialization stage. So what you see in the pictures there, there are two and three, that's what I did in the old days. I just, out of curiosity, I mix a bunch of a binder with a metal powder and throw it in the furnace and see what's happening. Luckily, it's not too bad. It's still a spherical shape. I see, oh, that is a potential proof of concept. Then it took me about four to five years to get to a PRL five and six, that nice part there. It's not an easy job. From there, I had to understand materials, I understand the properties of it, I designed the machines, and the encounter all sorts of the challenges. So if you want to have your funding, okay, the funding is on the right hand side pictures there. So if you see the funding available, so research grant, so the basic <laughs> research which you usually you have now, which your FRGS or seed funding by Utah. Utah are very kind to provide this seed funding for you to prove off certain uh, concepts. After you have done that uh, proof of concepts, uh, that is a dead value, you see that's dead value. Because a lot of people will die there. <laughs> because in Malaysia, I'll give you a bit of statistics, uh, by mostly, mostly say Malaysia are not lacking of journal publications. In journal publications, worldwide Malaysia have ranking, quite a good ranking. But from the publications to commercialization, uh, Malaysia ranking is almost, almost at the bottom, almost zero. At the bottom. So in the past few years, they are really focused on this area pretty much. That's why they demand you when you do FRGS proposal, you need to get company <coughs> intentions, right? And then they slowly enforce more and more industry players coming in, so that they hope that through industry collaborations, once you have certain research output, you can 
tied up with the industry partners so you can grow the products. That's how the case. Huh? That's also what the latest streams are doing. So that, that really is very important because uh, you can get the fundings from, of course, uh, the government is a big helper. Uh, they have a lot of money. But uh, one year for the grants that is TRL 4 to 6, one year is only less than 10 projects obtained. And out of 10 projects obtained, it's less than 50% can fulfill or finish it. A lot is tend to be white elephants. So, you have to go through the tech valley before you see the round A, round B. Uh, you always heard in the news, right? Just now you see the, the slide uh, by Dr. T's friends. The, from, yeah, from the D. The last slide. The, rate, the, the, the capital had raised 200 over 30 million in F round, right? The F. So before you can do the fundraising A, B, C, D, E, F, you have to make sure your products make money first. Then only the time you are billionaire. Before that, you still a debt holder. Probably your debt is a few millions in your bank account, so you have to pay a certain amount. So this is a big risk and also a huge reward you will obtain if you go through this successfully process. Which uh, I don't say I'm successful yet. We're still in the process of climbing out the dead valley hill there, but we are pretty much close. So how you leverage our academic skill network to grow your business? Basically, we have our great advantages because we learn and train to do the conduct research. So this is our strength. We should make you of this strength. And also, exchange expertise with your peer colleagues. Surrounding you lectures, it's all the experts around. We have experts from electronics, chemicals, materials. These are the huge network resources you have that can help you to solve the problems. And also information for university, government, agency, and industry players. And especially in Utah, we have a lot of industry players coming in, which actually they on and off they have a lot of problems. They would like researchers to provide a solution. Those are opportunities. You don't see that as a problem, but you see that as a money opportunity. If you can grab, you can solve that problem, I don't foresee why they don't willing to invest on you. Because now, Human talent is the most scarce in this part of the world. We lack our talents. We're not lacking of money. Actually, a lot of people are very rich. They're willing to spend. But we let our people can solve the problem, deliver the solutions. Those are things we need. So what advice tips you have for the postgraduate students who want to become an entrepreneur? Just like the pictures there, you are climbing up the holes. If you are not careful, you will fall in the dark holes. You will die in the dead valley. So if you want to be successful, I, I believe uh, you have to have those characteristics that I mentioned before, those are important. And I feel that it might not be suitable for everyone. Because not everyone's characteristics are born to have this kind of egos, this kind of passionate. So don't worry if you're not the kind of people. You can join us. You can join us both as a team. No need to be a leader all the time, right? But you can be part of the team where the leaders can lead you to the right direction. That's equally important. You can earn the money as you wish to grow as a team. You see, all Jack Mouse, all these Elon Musk, when they started their company, it's not alone. They have a group of teams of people to help them to manage and running the stuff. So if you're not the kind of people, no worry. You can join us. You can grow together. We have the special allocations to attract talents, to grow with the companies. Ideal case, people all want on the left hand side, but the reality I see is on the right hand side. Uh, almost day in, day out, I had to work after six. Saturday, Sunday, I had to work. No choice, right? Because my partner also working, so we only free after five. And then sometimes our uh, China suppliers, we have to fly them to China to assess their products, to deal with them. So there are all sorts of uh, socials and uh, skill set that you need to have your EQ, your IQ. So a lot of balances actually at the current stage that I have in the data Valley is not balanced at all. I would say it's a hard time to climb up. So once I come after the data Valley, probably I can enjoy this. Stuff. That's my <coughs> ideal case that I'm working towards on the left hand side. Okay, lastly, before we end, I just have a show on the, my company's uh, videos, corporate videos.
environmental and sustainability principles. We aim to become one-stop center for additive Solid Lab, Malaysia's first industrial 3D printing system developer. Our vision, to become a leader in additive manufacturing by providing 3D printing related solutions that meet or exceed our customers' expectations in terms of performance, cost, and speed. We strive to conduct our business in a professional and ethical manner with sound technical, business, social, environmental, and sustainability principles. We aim to become a one-stop center for additive manufacturing by providing Additive Manufacturing Service Industrial 3D Printing System Product Design, Engineering Strategic Partnership Solid Lab ME Plus is a cost-effective and versatile slurry-based industrial 3D printing system. It is the world's first multi-materials 3D printing system capable of producing functional metal, ceramic, and silicone parts on the same platform. The printing process can be conducted at room temperature without the need for a high power laser or heating element. It is an IoT enabled system with a desktop 3D printer and vacuum furnace for post processing to obtain functional parts. There's no requirement for loose powder handling and chemical washing, and no requirement for removing powder. Build plate and support. With zero build material wastage and minimal maintenance for the 3D printer, Solid Lab ME Plus is a technically, commercially and environmentally sustainable printing solution. It is capable of rapidly producing complex functional parts. And unleash design freedom conventionally limited by machining capabilities. <coughs> Solid Lab ME Plus is a truly cost-effective and versatile 3D printing system optimized for industrial applications, such as rapid prototyping, low volume, or customized part production. Solid Lab ME Plus. Unleash additive manufacturing. Thank you for further inquiry. As you can see, some of the examples where we did uh, with our systems. And also, yeah, welcome, unleash your design with Solid Labs. I hope you are getting some useful tips and you are welcome to join us if you have any ideas, solutions that you want to create but you cannot realize, we will help you to realize your dreams to make become the next entrepreneurs. Thank you. Questions? Anyone having questions for Dr. Day? Maybe I'll start with one first. Are you still single and available? <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my job and pension is uh, married to the, the company. So they're, 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 they're just kidding, don't need to answer this. Any questions from the floor? <laughs> Anyone interested to ask Dr. Day? We can take one question and then we have to move on to the next speaker. Nobody interested. Oh. Good. Thanks. Want to join us? <laughs> I'm just going to charge you for promoting your vacancy now. Uh, I want to ask uh, whether a PhD degree or your research experience really help you to get the funding or anything or getting the sales. Um, uh, definitely, that's for sure because in PhD it's not about the knowledge you gain. Actually, it's a training. It's a logical training. It's a logical mindset training that teach you how to logically plan things, things and solve a problem. That's a more important valuable key sets that you have in the knowledge you know in certain areas. So by for my aspect, PhD is just a uh, training skill sets mentally, physically, how to solve a problem more systematically. So by I mean you can mention to any field you like, as long as you are disciplined, you're willing to spend the time, I don't foresee why you can't achieve, you can achieve. Everyone has a great potential, I think. You don't limit yourself with the limit, say, ah, this thing difficult, I don't know. You should say this thing interesting, I want to take on a challenge, I want to conquer, then you will success. Thank you, Dr. Day, for the very interesting talk. Now, let us invite uh, Deputy Dean, Dr. Lee, to present a token of appreciation to Dr. Tay. Uh, hopefully you are starting to donate back to the time soon. <laughs> Thank 
thank you, Dr. Tay, for the very interesting sharing. Sorry for overshooting a little bit. Now we will invite our next speaker, Dr. Simon Yu, coming from the other side of the earth. Um, his keynote lecture today is actually Sickness of Opportunity, Synthetic Aperture Radar for High Resolution Imaging of Land Surface. Let me quickly introduce uh, Dr. Simon. Dr. Simon is actually a senior research scientist from Caltech and he is also one of the engineers under NASA, Jet Propulsion Repertory. He's coming from the US, all the way from US to share his uh, life after postgraduate study with us and also share with us his uh, research results and also research projects. Without further delay, uh, let us invite Dr. Simon to start his keynote lecture. Thank you. This made me to kind of like I think back about you know, what I was thinking to do, I mean, the, uh, you know, 40 years ago <laughs> when I just got out of the school. And so uh, I think the, uh, uh, I mean, definitely 40 years ago, right, I would not have imagined this world would be like this. And I definitely would not have imagined this would be what I have been doing kind of for 20, 30 years as part of my career. And so I think uh, I'm very glad to follow that to uh, presentation. And uh, why I've been kind of driven as a work, uh, in particular uh, for my area, science, understanding of the environment. And so what's the motivation? Number one, quest, curiosity, right? You ask a question, what's going on? What can make you uh, understand kind of what's happening? So that's the fundamental real driver. So after that, what's next, <laughs> right? The uh, passion. Like what you are doing, that's very important. Uh, if you like to make money, follow Dr. Tate's path. <laughs> if you like science, follow the other path. And uh, just really, really follow your passion. Uh, don't try to deviate from what you think you really want to do. If you like science, don't try to make a thing I really want to make a lot of money too. But something you can get both, right? That will be perfect for both. But a lot of times it doesn't behave that way. So I think those are the fundamental principles. I think you need to ask yourself. Uh, what you really want to do. And after that, you set your path, right? I mean, I also pretty force you to follow this a very rigorous, right? Very good testing, prior testing, or something like that. Those are the things you have to do. Uh, figure out your patient, figure out what you want to do, and then just do it. And the last thing I want to do is give you a kind of advice. Don't be afraid of failing. We fail many, many times. Many, many times, until you eventually find a solution. I think that's it. That's what you can, my advice to you. Okay. So today, is the, uh, what I'm trying to tell you is kind of something new that we are building and to sense the environment from space. 30 years ago, not have told you we could do this uh, kind of like today, but uh, we need to keep thinking forward about where we want to be 20 years from now, 30 years from now, so you can make your children, right? <laughs> have a better environment. Okay, uh, so I'm going to use this particular example as a driver uh, for you to know kind of like why the uh, understanding environment is very important. There are many things in the environment and uh, one of the very funda fundamental elements is the water. We live on the water, right? Everybody needs to drink water. And the other thing is the, uh, the water has many, uh, very many roles. Uh, the water, in fact, in the soil, uh, it provides the water, right, to the crop, right, to the tree, to the vegetation. They need to bring water, you know, to the grow. So we come on that. But water, right, also the uh, regular the energy changes uh, between the surface and the atmosphere, right, in the open area, uh, in the soil. So you cool down the surface, right? And the, the, the water in fact is greater from the surface, right? Maybe become the rainfall, you know, back to the surface. And uh, some of the, uh, uh, I mean, daily rain, right? The, we all experience, right? In this environment, whenever I ask about, you can get daily rain every day. May have a lot to do with the multiple area of the human pressure might be affected. And so, all those things together, I think the, uh, uh, the societal implication, but they are also pretty important science connection. Uh, 
uh, we need to know how, how much water right in, on the, uh, in the soil in Hong Kong first. <clears throat> and uh, once we uh, can have that kind of information uh, in a quantitative accurate way, then we can do the weather forecast, right? You can imagine that, right? And then there are other things. You don't like fresh water, right? I started then that the fresh water, right? It's a very uh, serious issue, create a lot of damage, right? many people for people's life. So there are many things that we want to avoid, want to mitigate. So knowing the amount of water in the soil is very difficult. And so uh, the other perspective, let me also show the uh, uh, the snow. Uh, I mean, maybe for Malaysia, yeah, I mean, you are yeah, less concerned about the snow. But the, uh, there are many people around the world, they are very interesting and, and concerning about the disappearing of the snow pack. They also feed a lot of people around the world, right? I mean, we all, you're all concerned about the rice, right? The growth of the rice, the rice production here. And but snow water, right, also supply a lot of water to the production. So let me just keep this. Uh, and then uh, what kind of tool, tool set that we have uh, available? And uh, we want to see the environment remotely from space. Why, want, why do we want to see from space? Right. The, uh, if I give you a pair of the tool and ask you to walk around the world to sample the soil everywhere, right? It would take years, years. It's impossible to do. And but if we, if we can design a tool operating in space, we can sense the entire world at a very high resolution every day. Who can think that the, this can be done ten years ago, thirty years ago? No, I would not have predicted this, right? But then this is something right thing to do. That's how I feel. So I think you ask yourself, is this something you want to do? Okay, so do we say this is, I say this is something I want to do. So there are many tools that we can use to sense the amount of water in the soil, in the vegetation and so on. Uh, one technology, <coughs> that was, that's what we call the radiometry, don't worry about if you don't know what this means about. It, uh, the soil actually radiate uh, emission micro energy, you may not know that. <laughs> The more the water available in the soil, the less radiation coming from the soil. So that's how the radiation works. work. And the other two is what we call the radar. Everybody know radar, right? So radar sends a signal, bounce up from the ground. The more water in the soil, the stronger reflection they got. That's how it works. And the other thing is a new idea that in fact we are pursuing a JP analysis Using a new idea to sense the soil. I use a multiple kind uh, of static scattering uh, called refractometry. And uh, so why do we want to have multiple set of a tool uh, available that will help you? And so the radiometry type of uh, technology, uh, it can provide a rapid uh, observation every few days, the entire world, the entire world, every two or three days. And But you only provide a special resolution that have kind of like a 30, 40 meter kilometer scale. You, you, when you look at that, uh, the entire Malaysia, right? You know, you can divide into a bunch of pixels. I'll show you some example for that. Uh, but then the farmer, right? They say, hey, I want, really want to know so much of it. A few hundred meters, right? Scale even much better, but one hectare like the level. Then you talk about the other thing, right? Oh, nice sun, yeah, the you have a radar. And also time scale, there is a kind of like a space uh, that we really want to explore. Let me see. Oh, there's another box, right? Like, Anyway, that's why. And so 20 years ago, I started to work on this uh, new technology. And then this, uh, <coughs> uh, the, it, you know, it looks small, right? But this uh, mesh antenna in space, it's kind of like a ceiling, like this thing. <laughs> so by the time, we, can we really put this thing to space? Can we? No, nobody can be sure. So that's why right, don't be a failure, right? You have a dream, you pursue it, and we think it can be done. More than just uh, putting such a yeah, huge device in space, we can spin it. We can rotate it. You, you take a big umbrella, you spin it, what will happen? If you don't do it carefully, right, your body also you know, cut the turn around, you may fall on the ground. So we make it happen uh, in 20 years. So we can set a, it's a Andre got much better animation. Uh, so we can cover the entire world uh, in two or three days at a resolution about 30 kilometers uh, to get so much in the uh, Let me see what can get this animation. Uh, so what you're seeing here is a combination of the data set from uh, two NASA satellites. <coughs> I 
think about the convenient people say that one sense of precipitation, rainfall, right? Who can think that now we can know the rainfall information daily, right? So this I mentioned is the uh, one very, very, very component kind of that you can see that the rain. And uh, look at the Malaysia that you <laughs> that we are dealing today. A lot of rain, right? In the tropical region. High latitude, right? Less rain, right? But in the kind of like different type of time resolution pattern. The background, right, is what we call the soil moisture. We can see the change of soil moisture today at any few day time scale. And look at that, the change of the, uh, the soil moisture pattern over the Malaysia. Okay. So next, uh, let me move to the next animation. Let's zoom in. Let's just look at the uh, environment we have to get today. So where we, where we are yeah, over here. You know where we are, you follow me. And so look at the, uh, this uh, soil moisture pattern across the uh, Malaysia. Uh, look at the, uh, the western side. <laughs> I started to learn a, a, a much more uh, from Dr. Nishi uh, two days ago. Then I kind of like, I want to look at this one. No, I know it makes sense. The western portion of uh, Malaysia is wet. Wet most of the time. It receives a lot of rainfall most of the time. And the eastern part also receives quite a lot of rainfall. Also wet, right? Uh, the wood gradually uh, look quiet. And the central portion, kind of green, is uh, kind of like less water, the mountain range. So that's why the paddy field, right, is on the western side. Now we can see this kind of pattern every day. But the farmer wants to get the resolution to 100 meters, right? Okay. Okay. So what I'm telling you is that this is not something you can imagine kind of 30 years ago. This, but now we have to make it happening. But we are not happy, right? We want to pursue further. <coughs> and but before I move uh, move further, I can tell you kind of like the uh, uh, information that we gain uh, from this satellite. Where I can help you? Uh, within the United States, uh, we got a Department of Agriculture, Foreign Agriculture Service. Uh, what's their role? Uh, they want to collect so much information so they can make a prediction of the crop production around the world. Why? To you, that to set the price of the crop, right? And that's a lot of billion, billions, not hundreds of billions of, of business. So they want to get information, and if they were at the so much information from satellite, can I help them? Yes, you can help them uh, by a lot. And if you look at the information that fall into this red area, with or without the so much information from satellite, then gain a lot of information to be able to predict the, the crop production. Uh, one month ahead of, okay, one month ahead. That's a, a lot of big gain uh, in terms of the our ability to predict the future. And I told you earlier, the other uh, application is a, is a flooding. So what caused the flooding? Too much rain, right? We all know that. But what's the other factor before the, uh, before the rainfall? If the soil is too wet, when it rain, the water has nowhere to go, it can go in the ground. It had to go to somewhere else, right? It had to go to the lower area that caused the flooding. So two factors, right? And uh, so what this is said to provide is the precondition before the rainfall. And uh, if we know this area is already sucky, and so when you see the rain it's coming, uh, then you have to get prepared. Right? Maybe one day to day, right, in advance. Okay. Uh, the other thing is what we call the landslide, right? Landslide well known. The same thing, the soft soil is too soggy, but it had to be high resolution. So even at the, uh, uh, the resolution to be, can be provided by SMAC, so the QMA, we can still create quite a lot from that. So we can still make the prediction of this type, right? But then obviously in the future, we want to get a high resolution data from the NASA as well. And uh, so NASA is going to launch a satellite uh, soon, uh, next year, in cooperation with the Indian Space Agency uh, to provide it has a 100 meter resolution. <clears throat> so eventually, what are we trying to achieve? And we want to gain this uh, so much information globally, and then at 100 meter, a few hundred meter resolution. So from the top, is it okay? I don't. Know. So the top panel, that's where we are today. That's the spatial resolution, kind of across a particular area. The bottom is where we want to get to. 10 years from now, okay.
Okay, so, so set the goal and then determine kind of what you want to do. And so the big radar is very expensive to build. Very expensive. It depends on who built it. <laughs> if we have a Dr. Tay, it's a 3D printing. <laughs> Maybe eventually we can get the uh, set high cost, right? Down to you know, 10 million, 20 million dollars. Today building a custom made set high is very expensive. The nice service will cost a billion dollars. Maybe it's a print 3D printing, can get it down to 100 million dollars. <laughs> And I think that's a kind of probability you know, for that, I'm pretty sure. Okay, so we're also looking into a new technology for similar opportunity. The reason why radar is so expensive is that radar uses a very powerful transmit you know, power source, kilowatt. You need to send kilowatt to the Earth and get it bounced back, get a refraction signal, determine kind of what you see on the ground. And so the idea that we have, let's use the uh, signal transmitted by someone, someone else. And that's called signal. Right, signal radiated by some other people, like the communication satellite. There are many communication satellites, like the GNS satellite, GPS satellite, many of them. Right? So why don't we consider to do that? And uh, in fact, uh, NASA and ESA, uh, European Space Agency, uh, they are launching, in fact, one mission is already launched, by using the uh, GPS type signal, signal got bounced off from the ground, got recorded by a small satellite. Million dollar, rather than billion dollar. It's really people printing power can get down to a hundred K, right? So, so that's kind of direction we need to move forward. And so, one set that has been launched, so the key is low cost, right? It's a business science, we all drive for the low cost. And it can also be done on the airborne platform. Okay, so this is a mission that NASA has already launched a couple years ago for sickness. And uh, it's doing exactly like that. But right? its primary goal is to get the ocean wind condition under hurricane condition or tropical cyclone uh, in this area. That's what you are called. And to get that on a daily basis, every few hours, you get the predictive probably well, what system may become a, a tropical cyclone, right? And I think here you're not less concerned, but in, people in here right? they're more concerned about that. And but this center is more than just. You know, being able to provide information to about the ocean condition. And as a scientist, right, scientists, they are very <laughs> innovative. <laughs> we take whatever data that we can get, and then we'll produce the data over the land surface. And then we can also actually produce so much information from that or work out what I call the whole reflection. And uh, so that chapter show one example that we have produced, uh, April, and then the October, uh, different type of uh, season, and the so on different for the, uh, 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 the America, which I don't have an example for this, uh, for this region, but, uh, in the future, I'm one. But uh, the image uh, that you see on the left hand side, you can also see in Malaysia, uh, those are regions covered by the forest, that's a smaller refraction. So why do you want to know that? The water content of the vegetation, uh, that's also very important, that determines the, the health of the forest. Uh, and then the, uh, why are we uh, working on this? The traditional technology that we're using only allows for this kind of single opportunity only allows to look at the, the data from the set, what we call the contract. And you don't, don't worry about that. <laughs> you don't know what that means. <laughs> and uh, if you're interested in this, and uh, you know, join the science community, and I think you can explore. And the thing is, it doesn't have a swath, so it doesn't create an image uh, like this map. So we want to see an image. Scientists or want to see an image to get a better understanding of spatial variability. <coughs> so coming back, so that's what I call in today's uh, presentation. I kind of want to give you a future, right? More than just what has been done today. That's what we call the signal opportunity synthetic radar by combining the technological NASA and moving forward in 10 to 20 years. That's where we want to be. Okay, get daily supporting at 100 meter resolution, right? Global. Right, more than just the given location. So how do we make it work? Uh, if we have a multiple small satellite, <laughs> now this satellite can be really small. Uh, each, each one can be that big, about a meter. I think 3D printing can do it. <laughs> and the big satellite that we built, have built for a map of NISA. The satellite is a few three meters, right? 3D printing, I don't know how they can get to that. Huh? So I think we're getting there, right? We're getting the uh, new idea. We also make it convinced 3D printing other technologies can make really low cost. OK, 
Okay, so the key idea is that once we combine the thing, we can achieve the kind of a magic form we want to have. Uh, in this particular case, right, uh, there are four uh, geostationary satellites, one just about almost your head. <laughs> Over the, uh, you just well, put it uh, on the right side here, yeah, you can see that. Just over your head, you know, in the ocean, not too far away. So that will bring your communication signal, where it takes you signal, right? We can find the, uh, uh, the small satellite underneath it and get the signal right from that. Okay. And so this is kind of just a simulation about what you can do. And uh, so with that kind of a uh, uh, system, then we can sample the, uh, the surface with high resolution. And uh, within a few days, in this case, kind of like about 100 meters or 200 kilometers well. But we can put many 200 kilometers well together to form a complete uh, image of the entire Earth. Okay. And how does this technology work? I'm not going to uh, go into detail for that. The signal uh, from the mills got bounced off from the snow or soil and they got made into a small satellite. And then we can use that information uh, to determine the delay time through the snowpack. You put your signal reflection from the soil. Then we get more that piece of information. And so, when you get this idea, right? What's the first step before you fall, right? Yes, we will fail. I'm going to tell you that we will fail. So you want to start from the low level first, right? Remember, Dr. Tate's presentation, technology really is stable, right? One, two, three, four, five, right? This is the one that we get doing. So we put in a tower, right? So when you fall, right, it won't hurt too much, <laughs> right? Okay, anyway, so after three years, we got to work. So we put a tower of snow, then we, now we can see the, uh, the change of snow, we can change the uh, see change of uh, soil moisture condition, we can see both, right? So we get the tower, we know how exactly how it works, <laughs> and uh, so this is easier to service. Uh, this is kind of what we felt. <laughs> so we got this a small receiver, got to work on the tower very well, you know, that tiny. So we think we can put it on drone, right? Small aircraft, and the aircraft can fly, right? And get up the whole much bigger area. And uh, so, we, you know, this is a tiny a person you know, kind of behind that. You can see, the, so it's not that big, right? It's small, small wing. So we'll put in North Kong area, we did a couple fly over a certain area. The drone will get fine, no issue. Uh, but the, the thing that we didn't recognize, that when you fly this thing in the mountain terrain, the weather is <laughs> very challenging. So when you find this drone, he called the tree die. And so anyway, that's the lesson there. Uh, so, uh, so the lesson is the, uh, uh, yes, we can make it really small, we can make it work. And, but be careful about there are many other factors, right? There are many, many other factors. You have to be very cautious. Okay. So the detail is very important. I'm going to add to that. Detail is very important. Okay, so our next step, we got one failure, so now we know, you know, the next step. <laughs> now we can make everything very small, and then we can fly it on the, uh, on the bigger airplane. Because we never fly a small drone like, over the mountain, right? It's probably not a good thing to do. <laughs> so we put it on a bigger airplane, right? So you can fly a mountain, right? Less affected by the, uh, the, the weather, and then everything is very small. And then uh, after that, we, we take out, we did our first flight, right? TRL 4. And it's last year, uh, at the beginning of this year, and for, for many times. Uh, the other thing that's kind of very enjoyable as a scientist, you got to visit those places you will never go, right? If you talk to Dr. Pace at laboratory, he'll be in the laboratory, you know, maybe many, many months, many, many. But as a scientist, we go around the world, right? So it's a motivation, and uh, you know, different career paths, right? You have a different uh, kind of like a feedback. And uh, so I got a chance to know many, many people around the world and uh, enjoy the all very complicated environment uh, myself. I, can also, I also get a little airplane and fly around. Uh, this is how it, how, how it looks like. Very beautiful, really beautiful. If you got a chance to work out in nature, there's a payoff. Not the money, right? <laughs> but there's a payoff. Okay, uh, so personally I would say I walk through the snowpack. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so you got to do this. You got to do the kind of thing no one else can do. No commercial fire will take you there. No, but you can do this, right? If you become scientist. Okay. Anyway, we got our uh, first uh, airborne uh, image. So bingo, right? Tail fire. <coughs> and uh, just confirm that we are seeing something that's correct. You know, the uh, data over the, the 
tree cannot be signal is weaker, or the open area signal is stronger, so every single thing. Okay, in summary, uh, from the science point of view, I uh, understand the, uh, the water uh, in the soil moisture, in the soil, in the vegetation, in the snow. Those are very important for understanding of the environment, but also allow to predict the future, right? Forecast the future. And then the uh, that technology, uh, I think that a lot of we use. The new tool, old tool, we've been exploring. We need to expand it. We need to produce a lot of it. mass production, right? That's what you call TL9, right? The mature technology, expand that because the cost is already low enough. But at the same time, you want to export the new idea. Right, do the the same objective at much lower cost, right? And that's why we are pushing. And so that's the last point. Uh, to you, uh, I've been to my presentation. Yes, hopefully. <laughs> So, any question coming from the floor? Maybe I'll start one first because Dr. Simon is actually a senior research scientist with a PhD. So, it's another different career path, not just academics. Then we have entrepreneurs, we have uh, others. So, um, question number one, Dr. Simon, why do you choose to be a scientist after getting your PhD? Uh, it's a very good question. In fact, the, uh, uh, when I was in the college, I actually uh, got my degree from uh, Engineer, because you know, at that long the time, so you, everybody wants to become an engineer. But in my heart, I always interested in physics. I know that, <laughs> and so I think the same. Therefore, I ask you the same. Uh, you said the, the same question. What is your passion? So I don't know the answer. Everybody has your own uh, answer, but ask the question. Thank you, Dr. Simon. So, how about students? Any questions for Dr. Simon, who is coming from the other side of the earth, all the way here to share his life experience with you? Anybody interested to know more about NASA? I'm actually a bit confused. You are actually attached to Caltech or NASA? Or oh, that's a very long story, but yeah, I can tell you in one minute. And uh, many years ago, the, uh, I mean, 1950 or something like that, uh, JPL found uh, Van Kalman and the other founder is uh, Chen Chui-Sen. I mean, many of you probably know that. So two co-founders founded uh, JPL. At that one time, the key business is uh, building the rocket, right? At that time, rocket is a key, was a key limitation, leveraging technology. So two founders built JPL called NASA, JPL Propulsion Laboratory. And then NASA is very interesting, these are uh, rocket technologies that need to deliver something to space, right? You, if you don't want rocket, you can do it. And now, now the rocket technology is so, uh, is so kind of like so cheap, so available. And then the, uh, the JPO of a common, uh, this, this guy, he was very interested in building the rocket technology. And then he did an experiment, right, on Caltech campus. <laughs> he blew <pulled> up. <laughs> so Caltech, right? No, no, you can't do this here, right? You need to find it for here, a way. So he founded uh, JPL, the Proportion Laboratory still under Caltech, because Caltech, when they say, no, not a good idea for two, they only to do this experiment at, on the Caltech campus. And then NASA said, hey, we won't really want to uh, have this kind of uh, expertise that Caltech can provide. And so therefore, now we become NASA the Proportion Laboratory by part of Caltech. Okay. Thanks for a very interesting sharing. <laughs> uh, maybe last one. Do you think Elon Musk is going to overtake NASA or do better than NASA? <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, I think the, uh, uh, I think just the same kind of a very similar type of response that I had. I think we all pursue our own dream. And I would not know exactly kind of like uh, what the answer would be exactly, but Elon Musk has his own motivation. As a science scientist, I have my own, my own motivation. Dr. Tay has his own motivation. I think that what we can do is just take your patient, move forward, and then we'll see what happens, right? 10 years from now, 10 years from now. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot for the very interesting sharing. Uh, <laughs> ask you after or after your talk or during lunch time. Thanks a lot for your sharing. Uh, now let us invite our deputy dean, Dr. Lee Kim Yi, to present a token of appreciation to our speaker.
Okay, th thanks a lot, Dr. Simon, uh, for coming all the way from the US to here. Then we invite our next keynote speaker, also our last one. He is uh, Dr. Andrea Corrandes. His keynote lecture title is NASA Soil Moisture Active Passive Mission Calibration Validation Approach Few Experiments and Results. Let me briefly introduce Dr. Andreas. He has a PhD and then uh, is currently working as a research scientist in the same lab as Dr. Simon. So he's also from Caltech and then uh, under NASA. Thank you. Okay. Uh, then, without further delay, let me pass the stage to Dr. Andrea. Okay. Uh, so, so uh, as, uh, as was introduced, I'm a research scientist, and I'll uh, give some thoughts about uh, being a research scientist at the end of my talk here. I'm going to uh, pick up from uh, the SMAP mission that Simon mentioned earlier, uh, talk about uh, about validation of that. And, uh, what we do to validate it. So here's an animation of SMAP, and as Simon mentioned, there are, it's a scanning instrument, so because it scans the Earth while it orbits the Earth around its poles, it can map the whole whole globe in uh, two to three days. So we get that's why we get this almost the maps uh, uh, so frequently. Uh, you see the huge antenna there, and then there's the small, uh, I don't know if it is, yeah, that was really well, but, so, you see the huge uh, antenna here. Actually, this is a tool from NASA website, Eyes on Earth. So you can find any satellite on that tool, and you can make this uh, look at these animations yourself too. And you can put these uh, scales there. So here's a school bus as a scale. So you see how how big the antenna is. It's, uh, it's really tremendously big, and then you need to rotate it, which, which was a real challenge. But the SMAP mission demonstrated that that can be done, and we will uh, we'll get measurement out of the out of the mission that can be used for science. Purposes. So, uh, important aspect of using satellite uh, measurements uh, is to validate them, and that's what uh, what I'm focusing on here. Is and you know, oftentimes these measurements are uh, focusing on on uh, their footprint on Earth, and it's uh, it's a certain size depending on the instrument features, a certain size of footprint it, that it's uh, getting the measurement from or illuminating it it's, with its own signal, whatever is the technique. And at the same time, we have uh, so that we, in order to validate, we need to have some kind of measurement on the ground to do it. But we cannot really replicate that uh, that footprint uh, automatically. So, for example, in soil moisture case, we're measuring the soil moisture on the ground from points. We can call it a sample and see how much water there is, or use these probes to measure it. But somehow we need to uh, make that measurement corresponding what the satellite is measuring, which is not a trivial task. For example, in soil moisture case, you know the Regardless of the size of the footprint, uh, soil moisture is very highly variable in space, so there needs to be a lot of sampling there with these point measurements. So, because of that, uh, otherwise it creates a lot of uncertainty in the comparison, and you don't really uh, comparing apples to apples, but uh, but uh, something else, and that would then affect how you uh, how you uh, in, in, uh, improve your or validate your product, or also improve your product, your measurement product from the satellite. So here is just an uncertainty curve for different cases. So when the you know the variability spatially changes, how it affects your uncertainty, and we use this kind of uh, analysis to de decide how to make that validation uh, on the ground. So for SMAP mission validation, there are multiple methodologies we use. The the first uh, one, which is used really to uh, estimate what is the uncertainty, is the uh, the core sites. And then there are other things like uh, which are multiple measurements uh, on the footprint, which I'll, I'll talk a bit more about. And then there are other ways of doing uh, validation, of supporting that validation. And then finally, another aspect which I'll talk a bit more about is field experiments, where we use these uh, uh, intensive campaigns on the ground to learn new things about the measurement. Uh, so, uh, in order to do this validation on the ground, we need to do it globally as much as we can. Of course, we cannot go everywhere and measure these uh, variables. That's that's why we do it from space, because so that we can map it everywhere, which cannot be done manually. But we need to set up some uh, places or use some other measurements to validate it. Uh, and so we work with a lot of international uh, people, form international network of uh, measurement sites 
in order to then cover as many areas and different areas over the globe as we can. Uh, and so, so for these uh, core sites, this is a network of uh, potential core site uh, sites over, uh, over Earth, and you will see there's a, there is quite a few of them. Not all of them okay. have enough that sampling density that we can, you know, you, you know, looking at those curves of the uncertainty, we cannot really reach the desired uncertainty over all of them. But these are sort of the candidate sites, and one reason actually why why uh, Simon and I are visiting. Malaysia is to see if we could establish some of these sites also in, in some places in Malaysia. So at each of these sites then there are multiple measurements as I said in order to uh, pick down the uncertainty. And so I'm uh, just showing you to give an idea, uh, you know, how they are, you know, all over places, different configurations. You know, it's a lot of work to get the handle of, you know, getting all these measurements. They are in different formats, you know, installed by different people. They should be calibrated, but there are also always issues, there are operational issues with these networks. And so we, but we just need to get all that data uh, uh, put together and compared with the satellite measurement in order to do the validation. And you see uh, how variable this whole set is. Uh, but what we do is then, when we get that uh, uh, set of measurements from each site, we somehow need to average all those points, and this is just one example. Of so that's an all area then, how to use this. We have these point measurements and the footprint, and we can match them, and then there is all the area of uh, sort of investigation, how to make those really representative, and uh, how to weigh those measurements, or, you know, what, what, uh, what, how, uh, uh, what are the techniques to use in order to optimize. But so eventually we get to the point where we can compare them. So here is then a uh, little bit uh, uh, too busy chart for this purpose, but uh, you see like a time series with multiple products, multiple alternatives, so almost the measurement uh, or retrieval products, uh, and then and compare it to the in situ, which is sort of a solid line, a little bit hard to see there, but the red solid line behind, and then you get the scatter plot of that. And so again, you have do this, the same process uh, uh, for all these sites. Uh, now if you have applied the upscaling also to every site, they tailor it to every site so that it would represent those as much as possible. And now you establish then the validation result for each site. And then you put it together so you have a lot of this uh, information that you need to contain. And then you finally can get to like a summary of, uh, uh, of your performance. And then you can get out and I'm not gonna talk about all the details, but the point is like, What's the process of getting this uh, validation together, and then uh, you will, you can focus on some re measurements. Like this is like a, a main, main number which we look at. But of course, you need to look at the whole big picture to understand what's the performance and how the, how it uh, works. So now then we you know that's sort of the operational validation of the product. But then there is these field experiments which we can use for learning new things. And something we've decided to do of a couple of vertical field experiments is. So they are usually short duration and focus intensively on, uh, on a few things uh, that we want to understand and learn. Uh, we use different methodologies, manual measurements, stations, airborne measurements, all coming together with the, with the satellite measurement. And, uh, and then we used, in this case, what I'm going to talk about, we use this uh, to understand better how the measurement works in, uh, in forested areas. Forested areas are extremely important. Uh, understanding uh, Earth system, and but in this map, this map shows the areas where. Oh, the arrow is supposed to be in there. So it uh, it shows the areas where there is a forest that, that we have determined from other sources that is so dense that it challenges the current retrieval, the reliability of the current soil moisture retrieval. So how to then go into this? Uh, how to measure also soil moisture in these areas is the reason why we then. Uh, started this experiment. So we conducted an experiment over these uh, basically three locations for forests. Uh, one started already in 2019 in northeast US and then we also have this uh, Canadian experiment uh, and it was also actually there part of it started already earlier in 2022. But 2022 we had the main parts of these experiments going and this just shows that we had some other experiments before too uh, which we used to, to learn some other things. So these sites in uh, northeast US, uh, there was these multiple measurement locations again. 
all these pins there had a station. I'll talk a little bit more about what the stations had. And then the yellow pins all were the sites where we do intensive measurements during 2022. And I'll have a, a few chart on that too. So, so what we attempt to do is sort of we have that uh, red area is where we sort of think that there's too much uh, forest there. But even, even if we have can, uh, measure pixels, this large footprints that are partially forested, even if they are not totally forested, uh, we can still you know, unmask a lot of area in the uh, uh, US, for example, here, you know, focus. So the measurements uh, were very extensive in the experiment, so we focused on vet station, uh, on the ground, of course, but then also vet station, and then some had some remote sensing measurements. So, so on the ground, we have those stations that I will describe, and then manual measurements, uh, and then vegetation, we did a lot of different things to characterize those. And actually, in the algorithm of uh, the soil moisture measurement, we can also measure the vegetation parameters. So we can simultaneously measure uh, some of the vegetation uh, transmissivity, which is like how much the vegetation attenuates the signal uh, and the soil moisture. Uh, so we wanted to also understand things about the, that so we could validate that which is uh, another challenging things to do. Uh, so the networks that were installed, so here is an example of uh, some of those forest networks. So they are these, basically these uh, stations where we have, you know, high terrain solar panel, uh, measurement of temperature, uh, but then also the soil moisture at different layers on the ground. And then we, we also see people installing tree sensors here. So, so we want to understand all these components multiple locations, so these were installed in all these locations where you saw those pins. So, and then manually, we measured soil moisture. Uh, so we had uh, these, but these are like handheld probes, and also they collect uh, soil samples to calibrate them. So we see uh, people going out and measuring them during those intensive observation periods. And you see different conditions, so in, uh, you know, it's a deciduous forest, which means, you know, you have uh, during winter there are no leaves uh, in the trees and then during summer there are big leaves in the northeast US. So that's why in the bottom figure there are no leaves there because that was taken in April. The first intensive observation period and then the second period in July when the leaves were on, you see, on the, on the left hand side there. And that's also another big, big aspect we needed to account for is this seasonal change of conditions on the ground so that we can capture all these conditions in order to uh, compare and develop and you also see differences here in terms of on the right hand side, this is an boreal forest, which has very different structure than the deciduous uh, temperate forest of the northeast US. So another example of measurement here, just like how you need to characterize the, the density. For example, here they use like they take a sample and then they want to know exact volume of the sample. So they put water in that volume and see how much water they put in the lab so that the, the density can be determined. So there are a lot of measurements that go into this to characterize what are the conditions on the ground that then, can, can, then the satellite measurement can be translated to this uh, physical parameter. So going to the vegetation measurements, so there's a, we had a, a lot of volunteers which we uh, invited to, to take part. So these are students basically who came to the experiment from different institutions, a lot of different institutions uh, and participated in sampling. So we had during an intensive period, we have uh, uh, 20 volunteer measurement uh, makers like, like these making these measurements. Uh, so they, here they are measuring the thicknesses of the trees and the tree height and, uh, and other parameters from the trees. And here they are uh, make, on the left side taking that soil sample that can be then uh, it, it's weighed when it's collected. Uh, it's collected and then dried and weighed again to get like that, like absolutely no well, how much there was water there that can then be used to calibrate the handhelds or probes, which are easy to use, but there is a lot of, uh, uh, there is a little bit of uncertainty there that needs to be calibrated with these measurements. And then also we took down branches uh, from the trees so that uh, we can measure how much water there was in the trees because that is the, what is affecting microwave measurements, is how much water there is. Uh, in, in the trees uh, uh, or whatever, you know, vegetation. Water is really what is interacting with the, with the microwaves. Uh, 
uh, more, uh, you know, top canopy measurements were also made so that we can understand uh, better the leaf water content impact. And uh, we did this actually multiple times a day to understand it, how that varies uh, during the day. So get that, that diurnal cycle of, uh, of uh, moisture changes. And another key aspect is how, how rough the surface is. It affects the micro micro wavelength is uh, in this case, about 20 centimeters for the, this instrument, it's 1.4 gigahertz. So, so this kind of the roughness effect is proportional uh, to, this, to the wavelength of the measurement. So, so we wanted to measure how rough the uh, surface was, and that was there would be used different uh, different uh, techniques. In the top, in the top plot, you see this traditional way of doing it. You have you sort of drop these pins that show you and then translate the roughness, basically, and then you take a photograph to, to get that. But then there is actually the bottom one, uh, that's just a raw, raw 3D LiDAR uh, image from uh, from iPhone or iPad, I think, uh, which they need to be cleaned up. That, that, that's something new that uh, we learned that you can use actually iPhone to uh, make like 3D images, which we could use for this purpose as well. But then more sophisticated LiDAR application is we had a team from uh, City College New York to do these uh, uh, measurements with this uh, backpack terrestrial laser scanning system which makes a complete image, 3D image of the, of the, of the forest. So you would see the person here walking through the forest and you know, it uh, creates this uh, uh, 3D environment of the trees and that can be used then to, as a uh, Describe the, the structure of the of the forest for the electromagnetic modeling that is used then in the in the development of the algorithm to get the soil moisture and vegetation parameters. So you can see how you know you can use that to find all the stems within that experiment area and the, and the height of the tree and a lot of parameters. So there's a lot of uh, processing work going on there to to get most out of. Interesting measurement is uh, this where we take this is a team from uh, the University of uh, Georgia. No, uh, no, uh, they used to be Mississippi. So they uh, have two GPS receivers, and then when they have one in the open area and the other receiver in the under the canopy, you compare those two receivers and you get the, the attenuation basically how much the forest attenuated that signal, and, uh, and that is. Exactly the kind of measurement we are also trying to get from our satellite, how much the forest attenuates the, the signal. So we can use this as a validation. It's, it's very an experimental measurement, but it's uh, it's very promising in terms of having something on the ground that we can use to validate the satellite measurement. So they have this setup uh, where they can, when they go into the canopy, they can have it uh, on their head, so because they can carry it around because then the body will be blocking the signal, so it has to be above their head. But then there was another application using the Boston dynamic robot to walk around in the forest and carry out carry that the receiver there, which was a very futuristic. Unfortunately, I have a video of that, but that's that's a very cool thing to see walk through the forest and carry that, that receiver there. So then they, this is an example out of those measurements. So they on the left the path they walked, and then the, the uh, difference in the signal in the middle between that open area and the, uh, under the canopy and then they translate that into that dimension. So what you then will do is we have to collect all that measurements and we did uh, something that uh, needs to be done in this kind of case. You need to work with a lot of people to get things out of this. It's, uh, it's a lot of data for collecting but also then processing and understanding it and analyzing. So we had a workshop earlier the year to Key people put it together, talk about it, um, and so here is some of the results just to get an idea. So we have all these almost the stations you see on the left, uh, on the right, which I showed. So they had these almost the sensors at different depths. They were actually in three depths. Like these sensors show like one vertically and then two horizontally, and then from all those we get a lot of uh, signals. And you see there's a lot of variability that's related to the spatial variability. I said uh, that so much you have so. You see they both, all the, usually, they all see that there is okay, like a rain event, there's a spike, so all sensors see that, but there's a big difference in, in that mean level of, of, uh, of those almost measurements. So that's, that's
that's the uncertainty. That's why we need to have more of them so that we can have a reliable mean out of those identity system mean uh, coming out of those for two different sides of those. But, uh, one, one was in Massachusetts and another, another one in the state of New York. So this is then an example. And this is then the value we compare the satellite and then we have these different depths of soil moisture so we can understand better what the depth of the uh, what what depth the satellite measurement best corresponds to. Going to tree measurements, I saw one of the photos there was uh, they were installing tree sensors. So this is an example of that tree sensor uh, reading and it shows the seasonal cycle of that. It's basically how much water there is in the trunk and it goes through this seasonal cycle and that water in the trunk affects the microwave emission again. So that's, uh, that's something we want to understand. And there is a fairly big change from for, uh, uh, winter conditions because the, these places go below freezing. So during winter, the trees vacate a lot of the water out of their trunks in order you know, the trunk not to you know, burst out of the, uh, uh, because you know, if the water would freeze, it would uh, burst up the, the trunk. So it goes, they vacate the water and then you know, it comes back during summer and then there is some growth cycle during summer. And, uh, and we see there is this characteristic curve related to that. So all this is coming out of the, of the sensor, station measurements where we have the three sensors. So uh, a lot more things to uh, take into account the process to understand, but also help us in, in terms of developing the, 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 so much the product. So those structural measurements, so we're measuring like, I don't think there are tree density, average density, tree diameter, tree height, and canopy depth, which is the high, height of the, branches, uh, you know, sort of a branch layer of the trees. So for each side, they did uh, tabulate it all, processed that, and then they you know, identified the species of the, at the different sites. So you see how many see different types of species there were. And then you put those into a, like, what they call allometric model, which is then can give you how much there was like, biomass. And we see then that for each site now, how much there was uh, estimated biomass based on those measurements. Again, something to compare with the, with the remote sensing measurements. And we see there's a lot of variability. In principle, fairly homogeneous forest when you first look at it, but we see that there is uh, some sites are like biomass level is double from the other sites. So, so something that is very important to understand. So going back to the soil moisture measurement then. So this is, uh, let me try to this. Uh, so we, we have on the left side, we have that back at this map measurement. So this is the satellite measurement over northeast US. So we have those two experiment sites here, MA and MB, Massachusetts and New York sites there. Uh, and we see like the satellite measurement before rain. So then there is a basically rain radar uh, images at the middle. So something that you can just find uh, you know, from, from one whatever weather forecast or something. So we see there was a couple of rain events went through uh, uh, through that area, and then on the right side we see that that again the same map measure, and we see there from there's a, in the middle there was a lot of uh, red, but now there's a lot of blue. That is the effect of the rain on the ground. Even if it's all forested area there, uh, we can see that that uh, affected the measurement. And in order to quantify that, then we use those measurements from the, from the experiment. So we have now the measured soil moisture on the x-axis and then the, the SMAP measurement on the y-axis and we do uh, regression and uh, from uh, all data that we have for those sites. And you know, in order to uh, account for the seasonal effects on the right side, we actually just focus on July and August when there is uh, uh, most of the canopies are fully lead, uh, the, the, the leaf uh, is fully out and it's the thickest uh, condition for the vegetation and we see we have a good correlation there even during those conditions during that time. Uh, this is Massachusetts site and same for Millbrook also. Uh, good correlation maintained even during the, when the vegetation was in, in the, in the full uh, leaf state. So concludes, conclusion. So on a first take a couple of works about the, the photos here. So these are all the people that participated in the experiments, both in Northeast US and in, in Berms in 2022. So
So there's a lot of people there uh, who were um, contributing, you know, mostly graduate students. Uh, but then we had some key people, you know, organizing it, and uh, you know, the people who hosted these sites who are there, you know, have to be left. They they keep uh, keep operating at those sites. Uh, so there is a, it's a huge team team effort uh, to run these experiments. But also for these graduate students, it's a great experiment. They get experience. They get to uh, you know see new things and uh, learn uh, new people and. Uh, and uh, yeah, they'll, they'll have, they remember those, uh, you know, they need to wake up early to make the measurements and uh, long days. And, uh, uh, they, some of them may the same thing, but okay, this is something I want to do, and some of them may say, okay, so I, I definitely don't want to say do this. So, but it's a, it's a good experience. We're happy to, you know, that uh, they get to experience that. So we, and, you know, do true, uh, through these experiment, experiments and the core size, so we are able to validate space for measurements. Uh, we have uh, these automated networks and, uh, and uh, uh, field experiments, and one of some of the tools that we use in this. Uh, and then now we are learning more about forested areas so that we can extend the map measurements through the forested areas and preliminary results show that uh, it should be successful. Uh, there's some other people, I just wanted to release this. These are actually not the field experiment people only, these are some of the key people from the field experiment, but then also the people who are running the course sites. So again, a lot of people involved like this is, this, this requires a lot of, uh, a lot of people at different levels, different positions, different parts, in order to uh, make this kind of satellite validation happen. Okay, so now I, uh, I then uh, I go to the final part, which is uh, why I'm a research scientist. Uh, I didn't plan on it, it wasn't my childhood dream or anything like that, uh, but uh, at the university I realized that uh, I got, I was applying for summer internships at different places, you know, like, uh, you know, you go um, uh, at different companies and you just send your, you know, CV or for whatever your CV at this is at that point and I hope you get something for summer to do. And one of the places for them at the university there was this lab where, uh, where I applied as well, and I got, got in, and I didn't know really what to expect there. But then I got into this measurement uh, uh, campaign and doing things. I needed to set up a measurement uh, uh, setup, you know, which involves, you know, doing mechanically something for the setup, coding to collect the data, and then you need to, you know, analyze the data eventually, and then you, you know, you write a report on that, and then. Uh, I was just doing that for a while then during the summer and then at some point I realized, oh this is something that actually people do and they get paid for it and this is, this is really fun. So that's just uh, why I just then uh, stayed, uh, you know, did my PhD there and, uh, and uh, I keep doing it because I like it. And I think that is really key to me, like you want to do what you like in the sense that uh, I was, when I, I was, uh, uh, 10 years at JPL, and uh, then I was asked, like, yeah, okay, so can you say, like, well, how, how, how do you survive at JPL for 10 years? And I, you know, I said, like, you know, the main thing is to do what you like, focus on that. And that seemed to be that that's not necessarily always uh, obvious, even for people who are already there at the research scientists, like, they, like, try to do, like, People want to achieve a lot, a lot of things. There are a lot of ambitious people, for example, at JPL. I feel like not everybody is doing it, spending their day, days doing what they like. They have just this ambition that they want to be this or that. And, uh, and it, it makes their life really, really hard. So if you can do something that you just like, you just go into office and uh, it's just something that you would be spending your day with, even if someone wouldn't pay you for it, that's like, that's really optimal situation. And then other things about, you know, if you want to be successful, also people have these ideas that they, they want to they start their career and then they, they want to be immediately be this or that, you know, leader or on in charge of that or director of that or whatever. It's just like very impatient. And in order to get there, I think, you know, one of the surest ways is, you know, not focusing on that, like somehow thinking about handling or whatever, but just just working 
what you're supposed to do, but also when you see a problem, just start solving it. Don't wait for someone to tell to you that, okay, there is something that needs to be solved. If you, if you see that there's a problem, fix it. People always, you know, love problem solvers. Like if you are known as a problem solver, then you have no problem of uh, finding a laser position. Uh, and then you want to, yeah, you want to really know yourself. You know what your strengths and weaknesses are. You want to identify it and you want to spend some time on self-reflection on that. So that then you can use your strengths and then when, and uh, really like situations when you know, they call for you, see that there, now there is a situation where I can use my strength, you go in fully. If you have an area of weakness, then you can think about it differently, how to improve yourself in that. That situation, but the identifying those are, are really, really important. And uh, then you want to think about uh, there's always, you know, any, any profession, anything, we are always subject to environment of uh, different people and uh, different, you know, cultures and sort of working cultures and all that. And you want to find a place where you are happy, even if you, your work itself is something you are happy about. There may be things around. And still, you know, I like it, and I see a lot of possibilities in this field, uh, in, you know, in, as a researcher in our field. So I'm not sort of planning on uh, changing my trajectory at this at that point, uh, at this point. So uh, that's uh, all I've, I had. Thank you. Thank you very much for your insightful talk, Dr. Andreas. So, uh, good question, actually. Uh, am I right in assuming that you're finished, actually? Yes. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, so, seeing how you and Dr. Simon have been traveling a lot around the whole world, uh, were there any particular countries in which you found any uh, collecting data was particularly challenging? Or was it all the same throughout the whole world in terms of collecting data? Ah, that's an interesting question. I think there are always challenges that uh, Everywhere is challenges, and then you want to overcome those. So, so that's uh, it depends on. I, I don't want to identify any particular place, but I would say it's it, whether the you find people. No, you need every place the local people who, who know the conditions and who, who are actively working on that. That that sort of the key. It's, it would be impossible to just go somewhere and do this kind of message today if you don't have the local support. And that's sort of uh, what, what unlocks it. Thanks a lot. Uh, maybe I have the last one, then we will move on to the next part. Uh, we will cover why you want to be a research scientist. I think that a burning question to ask. How much? Uh, sorry, what is the starting pay for a research scientist that is what they are always interested in? Because I get a lot of this kind of questions. 
uh, if I work as this, how much am I going to pay? That's why I asked the first speaker from the US as well, if they work in industry, roughly what is the starting rate? Uh, interesting. Uh, so I, it varies a lot between universities and places, and I think uh, it's just... Uh, uh, but it's public information, out of it, so I guess I can say some... some it's a little bit less than a little bit over 100k, depending on uh, 100k a year, depending on where you are. Thanks a lot for your talk.